Hi, thank you for joining us today for our Uranium Conference 4.0. We've put together an amazing lineup of the best companies and the best expert speakers for you to learn from, beginning with John Chapeglia of Sprott, James Sykes of Baseload, Bill Williams of Consolidated Uranium, Justin Hewen of Uranium Insider, Tim Gabrick of ISO Energy, Stephen Keith of Labrador Uranium, Per Gender of WMC Energy, John Cash of Your Energy, Corey Koss of Kazataprom, and Grant Isaac of Cameco. One person not presenting at this conference is John Quakes, and John is always a valuable source of information when it comes to uranium. I encourage you to check out his Twitter account at Quakes99. As you know, this conference is free to attendees, and we only ask one thing. Subscribe to our channel, Bloor Street Capital. Hit that notification button so you can be kept up to date on upcoming events. We have some amazing conferences coming up. Give us a like and also leave a comment. Once again, thank you for your support and I hope you enjoy the conference. Hi, John. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Toronto? Oh, hey, Jimmy. Good to be here. Uh, Toronto's great. It's finally starting to get a bit of summer. And, uh, and also at the same time, I've been back on the road meeting, meeting uh, clients and prospective clients uh, over the last couple months. So it's been, it's been good to actually get out to some conferences and see people for the first time in a while. Every time we speak, John, there are always significant developments in the uranium market, and that's why it's such a fascinating market. Bloomberg recently reported that the Biden administration is looking to secure over $4 billion in funding to purchase domestic uranium. And, and you recently spoke at the World Nuclear Fuel Market Conference in Montreal, which is aimed at utilities. So I'm curious to hear what people were saying, not only about Biden's announcement, but also about the market overall. But before we do that, why don't we just start with an update on the Sprott Physical Trust or SPOT. When you and your team took it over in July of 2021, almost a year ago, the NEV was 600 million. It had 18 million pounds. Where's it now? Yeah, well, we're just shy of 56 million, 59, uh, 55.9 and change uh, million pounds. And the AUM is just shy of 3 billion. And you know, a few weeks ago when the market was in a, a sell-off, uh, you know, uranium got caught up in that irrespective of its very positive fundamentals. And we definitely had some shareholders reach out to us and say, hey, you know, what's happening here? Why is the why is the sector selling off? And, you know, our message was pretty simple that in those kinds of sell-offs, the correlations go to one. And uh, even gold, which is the ultimate kind of safe haven, um, fares, fares well, but it still gets uh, put under selling pressure. So our message during that period was, look, the fundamentals haven't changed. If anything, they've gotten better. Uh, and that, you know, we will we will weather this little short-term sell down. And I, and I had the opportunity to meet a bunch of different investors from around the world. And, you know, a lot of them just said, hey, we're super bullish on the sector. But when the CIO calls and says, take risks down across the board, you sell what you can. And, um, and so uranium and uranium stocks, uh, we're not immune to that selling. Um, I think the storm has kind of passed. The, the AUM is is, is uh, bounced back. We had a, a discount to now that was was pretty severe for about five days, and, and it's amazing. Uh, you know, some investors called and said, you know, what are you guys going to do about it? And I said, nothing. Don't overreact. And sure enough, five days later, we were, we, the, a lot of that discount had been uh, eradicated because people see the opportunity. They come in, and, and I had one one fund based out of Brazil tell me they were buying like crazy. So you just have to let market participants uh, find those opportunities and, and help the fund get back on level footing. So as you mentioned, you were trading at a discount, but in the last few days, you've been trading at a premium. You're able to raise cash through the ATM, but you haven't been buying too much physical. Can you just tell us why? Yeah, so obviously we went through kind of a seven week uh, lull where we were not issuing and uh, we were buying a little bit of uranium on the way down. We we, we uh, pushed our cash position down a pretty small uh, percentage of the fund. And then uh, in the last seven or eight days, we've been back to a premium to nav. 
and uh, we've been successful raising capital in smaller in smaller amounts. So we're not seeing a big return, like a big rush, but we're seeing you know days where we're able to raise five or eight or ten. Yesterday was a little bit more than that, but you know we're just kind of chipping away, and we've been able to rebuild our cash position to uh, just over 100 million uh, of AU of AUM. And yesterday we bought 300,000 pounds. So we're kind of poking around and, and trying to find find material right now. But the market's tight. Um, yesterday's news from the DOE, we're gonna wait and see how that kind of plays out in the marketplace. Um, but so we're, you know, we haven't really done a whole lot, but I would say that our cash is at the higher end of the normal range right now. So you're sitting on 100 million in cash. Just remind me again, are you allowed to hold, is it 10% of NAV? Yeah, I mean, we we could push it as high as 10%. I think that would be a very extreme scenario where, where that would happen. Generally, but we've been running it anywhere from, say, 1% to 4%. And maybe you can give us an update on the ATM. Where do you stand on that, and what's the cap at? Yeah, so just for some perspective, last year from August to December 31, we raised uh, about a billion U.S. dollars, and so far year to date, uh, I think we're just through 800, 850, somewhere closer to 850, I guess, uh, which is pretty amazing given we had almost a two-month lull in the middle there. So um, appetite's, you know, still there in the last few days as people have gotten more comfortable with the markets and we're seeing a bit more risk appetite. Uh, we've seen the, the, the buying. I, I know of at least two new institutions that have um, stepped in the last couple of weeks. They saw the the the. Um, the correction in the pricing as, as an opportunity to, to build a position. So that's a good sign. You want some new people to come into the into the sector when it's especially when it's on sale. Uh, and, and those buyers definitely help to stabilize the fund. And, and what would be the nature of those buyers? Are they hedge funds or long only funds? Uh, my understanding is um, they're more hedge funds. Uh, one was in Asia and one was in North America. So that's a great overview of your physical trust product. Now let's move on and discuss your Sprott Uranium Miners ETF. Can you also tell us what the uh, current AUM is and what are the flows like in that product here in the last few weeks? Yeah, sure. So uh, the the Uranium Miners ETF uh, was reorganized on April 25th. Um, so it's, um, it's uh, still a fairly new fund for us. And uh, what's amazing is that, you know, these uranium stocks are obviously a lot of them are exploration development companies, pre-production, so they're they're naturally volatile. Uh, they're pre-production, pre-cash flow in many cases, uh, and they have very high sensitivity to the price of uranium and I would say overall risk sentiments in the marketplace. So we did see a pretty significant correction in a lot of these equities. What was amazing to us though is we had almost zero redemptions over that period. Uh, I think we had about five million of outflows, and in the last few days we're starting to see some modest inflows. So to me, that says, you know, investors are kind of holding the line. Their conviction was was no doubt tested, but they held they held firm and they didn't redeem. So I think that's a very healthy uh, healthy sign. Uh, the AUM of the fund is about 940 million right now, so um, it's it's clawed back a lot of uh, a lot of the, the the AUM you know depreciation from from the sell off. And remind me again, how many issuers are in the fund, and maybe you can just list the top three holdings. Yeah, sure. So I think there's 37 uh, constituents in the index right now. Um, the two largest are the two largest producers, which are Gazette and Prom and Cameco. So you get about a 16% uh, allocation right now to both of those companies. And then the Sprott Fiscal Uranium Trust is around 11%. Uh, and then I think the next largest holding is Paladin Energy. Um, and then it kind of falls down, um, down the list, smaller allocations to some of the key developers like NextGen and, and Denison. Uh, and then there's probably, you know, 25 odd uh, exploration companies. So you get a very, you know, broad cross section of companies within the sector, which we think for a lot of investors makes sense because they just don't, they, want, they don't want to put all their eggs in one company or two companies. Um, and then they don't want to do the technical work or, or follow the companies given there's a lot of news and technical information you need to follow. So it's, it's, a, it's a convenient way to get a cross section of producers, vehicles that own the physical, development companies and exploration companies. And that ticker is UR, URNM on, on the New York Stock Exchange. John, as we mentioned at the onset, you recently spoke at the World Nuclear Fuel Market Conference in Montreal. It's an annual conference aimed at utilities. 
And I'm kind of uh, curious, how was the reception? Did they welcome you with open arms? Yeah, it was interesting because um, I spoke to the group uh, last July when Sput uh, was uh, created, but it was in a virtual forum, so you really don't really, you know, you can't really gauge your audience. So this year at the at the conference, which was in person in Montreal, they invited me to speak. And you know, look, I'm I'm used to typically speaking to an, an investment audience. So when you're engaging with with the fuel buyers from utilities around the world, it's a very different audience. And and they're they're truly curious about you know what's what we're doing with the trust, how it's operating. I I would say there's still this lingering perception that somehow the trust is going to have its um, material available to them, either for sale or for potential lending. And I made it very clear in my presentation that. Uh, you shouldn't make that part of your strategy. Uh, you need to go and procure your own uranium. Uh, our investors are, have done that because they have a bullish view on the price. And um, you know, you can look at our fund; it's very transparent. But it's it's not a trading vehicle. It's not a market timing vehicle. It doesn't have a redemption mechanism. It doesn't have a lending mechanism. Um, and so, I think for some of them who are typically you know engineers. Um, they find the whole thing a little bit odd and irrational because it's, you know, wh why would you why would you stockpile all of this stuff? The reality is, is that in all the commodity markets, uh, there are financial speculators, there are investment funds and financial engineers, you know, whether it's oil or wheat or natural gas, you, you know, you have all of these different participants that are not end users of a commodity that want to be involved. So I think for many, many years, as non-utility buyers stepped away from the marketplace, they got very accustomed to, to having the whole market to themselves. And that obviously changed in the last 12 months as more and more non-utility buyers have become very active in the spot market. So I think, you know, hopefully my message is getting through to them and they have a better understanding of the, of the trust. And so having said that, with the with Splat being more active in the market and other non-financial or non-utility players being involved, also with the geopolitical situations that are going on in the world right now, what was the mood like with these utilities that you spoke with? Yeah, well, I would say the mood of the conference, again, this conference is specifically about fuel, nuclear fuel. Um, I would say the mood was somber. And the, the reason why the mood was somber is because the geopolitical um, uh, drivers of the market right now are, are, are at extreme levels. And what I mean by that is that um, the Western world has underinvested. Um, and they underinvested and they've shut in capacity during the, bull, the, to, during the bear market. And so you had, you know, whether it was mines getting closed in, in the United States, uh, conversion facilities closing. In the United States, or facilities basically scaling back, or companies going back bankrupt, um, we, you know, the utilities became dependent on on Russia for those services, not for the physical uranium, but for the services for conversion and enrichment. So, in a world where people are trying to realign their their supply chain away from Russia, and there's no fallback capacity in the West, they're all trying to figure out what to do here. And this is really the catalyst for why the Department of Energy uh, in the United States announced yesterday that they want to, they're asking Congress for, for funds to help uh, support the financial requirements needed to do this transition away from Russia. So as a utility, you're under all this kind of moral and ESG pressure to figure out how do I, you know, stop buying from Russia? Um, and but you know at the same time there's no capacity in the, in the United States, France, and Canada until there's long-term contracting, and that was a very clear message that the you know the Converdines and the and the Arankos of the world you know and the Camacos uh, articulated to their utility clients to say look we're not going to make these huge capital investments um, you know buy new equipment hire back people ramp up production without long-term contracts because you know they went down that path in the last cycle and they got burned so it's a bit of a you know it's a bit of a, a staring contest right now around you know you want to pivot away from russia supply but where's the capacity um and so it's going to take time it's going to take time to to restart plants i mean comradine for example is going to be restarting in 2023 it's it's been closed since 2017 the plant has been closed so you just don't, you know, start up a plan overnight because you've got some, 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 you know, new, new customers. It takes a long time. 
So this is the reality they're trying to figure out is how do they wean themselves off? And this is obviously a part of, you know, part of this deglobalization or, you know, onshoring strategy that we're, we've all kind of figured out needs to happen so we're less dependent on certain nations. And just as a reminder to our viewers, the U.S. is the largest consumer of uranium in the world. They consume over 50 million pounds a year just to feed their nuclear reactors. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the U.S. has not been building reactors like the rest of the world has, but its existing fleet is so big that they are the largest consumer. And uh, I recently read a stat that said that a total of 21,000 pounds of U-308 were produced locally in the United States last year. Uh, which is astonishing. So there's no security of, of base feedstock locally because all of those uh, all those operations are on care and maintenance uh, in Texas, Utah, uh, Wyoming, and whatnot. So there's a lot of interest to get you know domestic mining back online, and obviously to get uh, the service part of the fuel cycle back online, so they don't have to rely on Russia. And just to, I just want to ask you one more question about this this announcement that was made by the DOE. Once again, we haven't seen a lot of details associated with it, but can you just put this into perspective for us? Four point three billion dollars worth of enriched uranium. Yeah, I mean, as you said, the details are have not been have not been disclosed, and it's the initial proposal they've sent to Congress. So it's hard to quantify exactly what this. You know, will ultimately lead to and over what period of time these purchases will occur. But I think the main takeaway is that the government is stepping in here and intervening in the market, which generally governments don't want to do. Um, and most participants don't want governments to intervene in markets. But I think the reason they're doing it is because they are generally concerned that uh, if they don't get involved and help kickstart this pivot, um, that they won't be able to to uh, they won't be able to accomplish this, and if they can't accomplish this, um, their reactors are gonna are gonna have security supply issues and, and potential operating risks. Um, and so you still have 20% of power in the United States gener generated by nuclear. And if you're still, you know, if you're dependent on Russia for fuel, um, let, let's flip it around and say let's say Russia withholds deliveries. That's, that, that can cause a very short-term uh, issue for sure in terms of where you find supply in the near term as facilities are trying to reopen around, around the Western world. So in addition to speaking at the World Nuclear Fuel Market Conference in Montreal, you were also at the Canaccord Conference in California recently speaking with sales or buy side uh, investors. Why don't you provide some feedback? What was the feedback you heard from them? Yeah, so uh, it was really great to hit the road and then meet a bunch of um, existing investors that we have. Uh, there's a bunch of family offices out in California that were early investors in SPOT. Um, so it was good to finally meet them face to face after a lot of Zoom calls. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in the category. And, um, you know, irrespective of, of, of the sell off that was kind of occurring at the same time as the conference, I think people identify that it's a very interesting thesis. We're starting to see people that are involved in other parts of the energy cycle. So, for example, we talked to people that are very invested in natural gas, but they see the they see the relationship with with other parts of of, of the energy uh, mix, including nuclear, and they're interested in learning more about nuclear. Um, so, definitely, there's 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 growing interest in the thesis. You know, I think right now we're in a good spot with with markets kind of calming down and people. Uh, not being forced to kind of bring down risk exposure um, that you know we've clearly seen uh, the flows come back in this spot. So look, it's 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 what we're doing. It's education. It's promotion. Uh, it's it's just telling our story and repeating it because you know um, a lot of people still don't understand the sector. They're getting up to speed, but I can tell you that that what's what's played out here in the world. Uh, even before Feb 24, I mean, it's really opened up a lot of people's eyes around how vulnerable we are across the whole energy spectrum. Um, and, new, and and there's a growing realization that, that nuclear can be part of the solution, uh, both short term and longer term with some of these advanced technologies that, that people, uh, the governments are funding and, and, and private companies are, are, are trying to develop. And I think that's another interesting area that people are getting uh, more and more interested in.
So the messaging that I'm hearing from you is that when you go to these conferences, there's still a lot of people that aren't even fully aware of the potential of this trade. And so in other words, there's still lots of upside. Yeah, I mean, one of my messages at the conference uh, when I spoke on, on Monday was that uh, a lot of the really big investment funds can't, can't, cannot get positioned in this sector uh, because it's still too small. Uh, if, you're, if you're running uh, some of these funds that are in the tens of billions of dollars, um, it's very hard in terms of building any kind of relevant position because there's just not a lot of depth of, of, of companies. You know, if you if you go down and look at the largest cap companies in the sector, you, you know, you you hit uh and Prom and Cameco, and then Spot is like, believe it or not, the third largest market cap. Um, and and then it falls off pretty sharply. So for these institutions, it's hard for them to come in and, and really build a meaningful position. And I, you know, I think people are realizing that you've got this critical mineral that's uranium. And 70% of its production around the world is still controlled by either state-owned uh, or state-controlled entities. Uh, and those state-owned and controlled entities are basically in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Russia, and China. So it's a very concentrated market in terms of where the world is getting its feedstock uh, from. And, and that makes this whole supply chain uh, much more susceptible to, to disruptions like we're witnessing right now. John, as we wrap up, what can investors expect in terms of news flow from Sprott Inc. in the coming months? Yeah, well, listen, I think we're we're very bullish on uranium. Um, so we're going to continue to focus our efforts there. We recently, in May, partnered with a with an outfit in in London called Han ETF, where we essentially um, created a clone version, if you will, of of URNM. So there's a usage version that trades in London and um, Italy and, and Germany right now. Uh, we see growing interest in Europe in, in uranium and nuclear, so we wanted a way to be able to uh, offer product directly to those folks. So that's, that's been uh, live and trading for about three weeks now. Um, and we're very focused on the, these, these big picture themes that we're seeing right now uh, related to energy transition and decarbonization. I, I think uh, we're very, uh, constructive over these themes over many, many years. So uh, we're definitely working on some ideas in those areas. Well, we look forward to hearing more about that. John, once again, thank you very much for spending time with us today. It's always enlightening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Hi, James. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Saskatoon? Oh, they're wonderful, James. It's uh, definitely a great place to be. Nice and sunny. Can't complain. James, you worked at Denison, Hathor, and NextGen. And at NextGen, you were instrumental in discovering the aero deposit, which now has close to 300 million pounds of uranium in all categories. So you're very knowledgeable about the Athabasca Basin. And because of this knowledge, you and your team have a unique perception on the basin, which means exploring outside of the traditional boundaries of the basin. And I just want you to expand on this thesis and tell us what exactly you mean by the Basin 2.0. Yeah, it's a great question. We call it Athabasca 2.0 because as you mentioned, I've got a lot of experience in the basin. I've I've done a lot of research as well, and being on a number of discoveries and comparing that to previous deposits that have gone into production, there's a misnomer in the Athabasca exploration side of things. And that everyone, you know, Athabasca is known for high grades. There's no doubt about that. But what are those things that go into production? Historically, it's been open pit deposits. Now, only two, only two deposits within the basin have gone into production, and that's Cigar Lake and MacArthur River. Why? Because they're both extremely high grades. They've got over 20% average grades when they went into production. Those are the most valuable commodities in the entire world in, in any mining jurisdiction by far. It's, it's crazy the amount of wealth in those mines and that's why they were able to go underground. But that's what people have been searching for are, are those deposits, yet they're the unicorns of the entire industry. 
So after after next gen success there, and when I was approached to run baseload, we you know I, I had this working thesis. I ran it by the group, and we hit it off, and we decided this was the way to go forward. You know, let's re, let's rebrand exploration thinking. Let's look for those classic open open pit style of deposits because you don't need the grades you don't need the cigar lake grades you don't need the MacArthur river grades you can have a lower grade than what people know the athabasca for and those can go into, into open pit mining so it's that's what athabasca's 2.0 is all about is getting back to really the roots of it all and just a couple of questions on what you just said. First of all, you said over 2 billion pounds of high-grade uranium has been discovered within the basin, but very few deposits have, have been mined. And why is that? Well, it's exactly that reason. It's the, it's the sandstone. When you're, when you're exploring within the Athabasca sandstone in the basin itself, there's a lot of water issues with it. Both Cigar Lake and MacArthur River flooded twice, but the open pit mines a lot of those were didn't have sandstone and they didn't have those water issues so it's it the sandstone itself per, it poses a lot of mining engineering problems and that's why you really need those extremely high grades to to really justify going down underground for it and when you talk about flooding um maybe you can just expand on that and quantify it for us yeah well, the sandstone itself, it's a flowing aquifer, so there is water that is still flowing within the Athabasca Basin itself. Now, the basin dates back to 1.7 billion years old, and there's still water in it, which is you know, it's a crazy concept to think about. You know, you've got 1.7 billion year old water in there, uh, hypothetically. But, and, and that's the thing, like it's in parts, it's a kilometer deep, so you've got all of this water that, that can come down. When they tried to go underground at Midwest deposit, they were pumping out 74,000 liters of water a day. That's a huge volume of water. And what do you do with that? You can't just throw it back into the surface. You need to, and especially if it's considered to be interacting with uranium, then it's going to be considered contaminated. So then you have to set up all of these different um, different pools to really decontaminate the water and put it back into nature but then again again that's that's 74,000 liters of water i can't even imagine that I, I can't think of how much water that really is but it's it's definitely a lot wow that is a lot of water and see that's one of the things being a finance guy i have no idea of the detail that goes on behind the mining process. So thank you for explaining that. I want to move on now and discuss your properties, your primary property where you're you're exploring and achieving most of the, your success is called Accio. What makes this deposit so unique and why are you spending all of your time here? As per our Athabasca 2.0 thesis, we set out to specifically looking for near surface, open pitable, high grade uranium deposits. And that's what Accio is. Uh, since discovery, it has been very shallow. Most of the mineralization that we are seeing is anywhere from 25 meters beneath the surface down to about 100 to 150. So there's a lot of open pit material that we are seeing at Accio. And that's really what sets us apart from all of our peers is that it's it's a very shallow mineralization. There are a few out there that are very similar, but we've also got proximity to infrastructure, which really helps. And how shallow is it, and how does this compare to MacArthur River? Very shallow. Again, we're in we're in op classic open pit range, which historically in the Athabasca has has gone down to 100 meters, 150 meters depth, and that's where we're seeing our mineralization, all the way from 25 meters down to 150 meters. So it's it's quite wide open. MacArthur River, they're they're mining down to 500, 700 meters depth. Uh, Cigar Lakes around that, that 300, 350 meters depth, and it's just classically too deep. They, even my work at, at Hath or, or Rough Rider, most of that deposit was between 200 to 350 meters depth, and that just proved to be too deep to really move a, a wonderful deposit as Rough Rider is forward. And when you look at the map, it looks like it's relatively close to MacArthur River and also Key Lake. What is the actual distance? As the crow flies, we're about 30 kilometers southwest or southeast of MacArthur River. 
and then we're about 70 kilometers northeast of the Key Lake Mill. So very close to infrastructure. We've got two highways on either side of the project, both about 30 kilometers away from where the deposit is. And then there's power lines uh, that are within proximity to us as well, airstrips at both Key Lake and MacArthur River. So there's a lot going for it. To, to put a, a road in from, from the Key Lake, the MacArthur Hall Road, really wouldn't take that much if you're talking 30 kilometers, that's not an excessive road by any stretch of the imagination. And you recently issued a press release which highlighted near surface mineralization at Akeo. Can you provide us with some more details on these findings? That was, that was absolutely wonderful. You know, it's something that I wish we had planned, but it was a very pleasant mistake in a, in a sense. Not even a mistake, just it, that's exploration. You pop a hole in targeting one target and lo and behold, you hit this other target and we couldn't have asked for anything better. It was mineralization started at 25 meters, basically true vertical depth. So right underneath the under, the overburden contact, you hit mineralization. That's as shallow as we can get at, at Accio for sure. And the, the extent of mineralization that we saw was about 30 meters drill hole thickness. We don't know the true, um, the true, the true thickness of it, uh, it's, it's rather difficult to, to extrapolate that at the moment just because we don't have enough drill density to really define what the true thicknesses are, but 30 meters drill hole depth is absolutely wonderful. And the concentration of or the levels of radioactivity was, was phenomenal. It was one of the highest levels of radioactivity or average radioactivity that we saw in any drill hole. So coupled with the, the 30 meters extent, it's a, it's a whopper of a drill hole, that's for sure. And you mentioned earlier that you thought this would be open pitable. When would you be able to define an open pit? That's going to take some time. There's no doubt about it. We have to drill this off and there's a lot of surprises that keep happening at Accio. But the bulk of mineralization that we are seeing is between that 100 to 150 meters depth. We don't have any overlying water bodies. Uh, it looks pretty simplistic as far as an open pit style of deposit goes. So we feel very comfortable that it is something that, that can be achievable in the, in the future, but we really have to delineate how big this is and you know, how, how much tonnage is really going to be there. Because in the end, that is going to be the overriding factor. If there's, obviously if there's not enough mineralization or or, or as, as we could say, um, getting to a point of open pit, then then it wouldn't go forward. So internally, we do believe that it has all of the right characteristics to become an open pit. Having this near surface mineralization is by far the best thing we could have asked for because as you're, as you're excavating the pit and you get rid of the overburden, you're immediately into mineralization. And that's, so as you're expanding the pit to get down to, to the bulk of the deposit, you're, you're extracting ore right away. You've got value in the rocks that you are extracting immediately. So it's, it's not one of these situations where you have to dig a pit down for 200 meters and then start extracting ore. You're extracting ore as you're creating the pit. And that's positive NPV right away. And that's, that's an absolute phenomenal thing that we have going at Accio. And you mentioned that the grades are lower than what you might find at MacArthur River. And given that MacArthur River has some very high grades, do you or would you ever envision a scenario where MacArthur River uses the ore from Akeo to downblend its uranium with the lower grade ore? I would like to believe that's a possibility. And that's, I guess there, there's two answers that I will give to this. Uh, one being that, yes, MacArthur River has to downblend its ore to to be fed into the Key Lake Mill, which is optimized for about three to three and a half percent. Right now, they are using Key Lake waste material. So I honestly would, wouldn't know if it would be a better impact to use Accio ore to downblend uh, Key Lake, especially when they've already got, or to downblend the, the MacArthur River ore at Key Lake, especially when they've already got the, the Key Lake waste there. But you know, we're hoping to define a large enough deposit so that we can either A, yes, use the material to downblend MacArthur River or if it proves to be a higher grade than the waste rock they're using from Key Lake, just you'd be sending less material in through the mill and that's you know, always cost saving, but then economics come in. You know, is, it, is it a cost saving to mine something out to downblend versus using the waste? Or the other option is if 
if we do see this as being viably economic, then we could always upland it at site and bring it up to that three, three and a half percent type of range, and then run that through the middle as its own. Now, if there's if there's a um, some sort of offtake situation or use ability to use the mill at Key Lake. Uh, the other the other thing I'd like to mention, you just mentioned it there is uh, the MacArthur River grades, and I want to point this out. And this is, I, I guess I should have mentioned this about Athabasca 2.0. Yes, MacArthur River, when they went out mined, had the highest grades in the world. It's over 20%. Cigar Lake, same thing. And this is where a lot of investors think that you need high-grade uranium in the Athabasca. Everybody, That's why everybody thinks, oh, Athabasca is the best place in the world because you get all of these high-grade deposits. You get a lot of them, yeah, but how many of them have gone into production? Uh, Two billion pounds of discovery and not even half of that goes into production? You've got 25% of the deposits that have been discovered over the last 70 years have gone into production. And a lot of these deposits are quite robust, quite sizable. The ones that have gone into production, again, are historically the open pits and their grades are not extravagant. Rabbit Lake, which was 40 million pounds, had an average grade between 0.23 and 0.27%. Now, orders of magnitude less than what people think. Same with Clough Lake, uh, average grades around 0.3 to 0.37 percent. Same with Uranium City, 0.2, 0.27 percent, somewhere in those ranges. And those are what have been proven to go into production in the Athabasca area. Not these one percenters, not these five percenters, not these ten percenters that everybody associates with the Athabasca. That's where I, I think there's been a lot of red herrings thrown out there to the investment community about grade is king, grade is king. No, not really. When you when you do your homework and look into it, grade's not really king. It's near surface mineralization that trumps everything. So let's move on now. I want to discuss your exploration program. You have a very ex uh, aggressive drilling program underway at McHale. Tell us a little bit about it. How many meters, how many rigs do you have currently working? We started this winter with 10,000 meters in mind, and then we got permitted for 60,000 meters, and we were fully funded for it. So we just said, let's do it. Let's go for 20,000 meters. So currently, as of as of our last press release, we were close to 15,000 meters completed already. We've got two drills that are operational, and the drill company, the Full Force Drilling, have been absolutely phenomenal. They've been they've been swamping us with core, which is the situation that we want to see. So we're we're expecting to actually drill more than 20,000 meters by the end of the year and end of the year probably around October sometime in, in that time frame but yeah with the two drills going we can see a lot of core continue to come out of the ground they must be incentivized by their bonus checks <laughs> yeah I think so they typically are James given that you do have two rigs and they're drilling aggressively how often will we see results We've been putting out news results every two to four weeks, and that's based on radioactivity. So as we measure the uranium mineralization, it, it emits radioactivity. We capture that with a handheld scintillometer, and that's the those are the results that we can put out basically immediately. So we like to you know, we like to update the investment investment community. And one of the problems is that nobody really understands CPS uh, counts per second. That's just a form of measuring radioactivity, no different than Becquerel's or Curie's, really. So what we are trying to do is provide a, a clarity, but it's going to take time that you'd be able to uh, compare the CPS results that we're getting with the assay results we're getting once we start getting back those back. But even once we get the assays back, we'll report them in the same fashion that we have with the, the radioactivity results, the same drill holes that went out in the news releases. So as the assays come back, you know, how, how fast they are, they'll be reported within that two to four week time frame as well. So it's, it's nothing but steady news flow from baseload for the rest of the year. And waiting on assays probably going to be until 2023 as well. I'm not saying from the first drill holes, but <laughs> When the, when the last drills wrap up, we probably won't get those results for some time into the new year. And when do you expect this current drilling campaign to end? Around mid-October, early October, mid-October, somewhere around there. 
So you have two other properties, uh, Catharsis and Shadow, both of which are also outside of the boundaries of the Athabasca Basin. Why don't you provide us with a brief overview of both of these projects? Yeah, they're all staked on the same merits. So our hook project that hosts Accio and Catharsis and Shadow, they were all staked on the same merits. So we think that there's a lot of potential for uranium mineralization on all of those projects. The structural interpretations that we've done for both Catharsis and Shadow are what I would believe to be quite phenomenal. I think we see a lot of potential in those. And so each of those projects are getting flown with, with airborne geophysics or have been since, since inception. And the idea is really just to build up our, our targeting platform before we go out there. We like to be very uh, aggressive, yes, but we like to be very efficient with our exploration dollars and target what we feel are the best of the best anomalies as quick as possible. And that's it's you know, and it's the best way to use shareholder funds. So currently we do have some we are flying some airborne surveys over both hook and catharsis. Shadow is still in a little bit of a hold off situation simply because we are uh, still in negotiations and consultation with the, the First Nations in that community. So it will take a little bit more time for, for that project to get going, but we feel very positive that down the road we will we will be exploring Shadow. And Catharsis, uh, I was earlier in the year, I was being quite optimistic and, and aggressive in my exploration attitude. I love to explore, I love to see drill holes go into the ground, but we have decided to to hold off on any diamond drilling or much of the any any exploration on catharsis as well. Just stay with the airborne geophysical surveys and then that'll hold us till next year and then we can reassess. All, all of our dollars have to go into Accio. It's as simple as that. So let's move on to your balance sheet now. Cash is the lifeblood of an Explore Co. How much cash do you have and how long will this cash last? We started the year with 20 million. We are now currently at about 15 million. We're burning approximately a million dollars a month. Now that the winter's over, we should actually be burning less. Just it, operations are a little bit more optimized in the summertime. But uh, yeah, with the two drills and helicopter support, we are we are burning basically a million dollars a month, and that's that's M and A included in that. So we're you know, I, I think we're pretty efficient on that regard as well. So we'll have sufficient funds to get through to finish off this drill program and even have some to start next year. James, as we mentioned at the beginning of our discussion, you were involved in the discovery of the aero deposit, which now has close to 300 million pounds of uranium in all categories and a market cap of close to $3 billion. Is a KO the next aero? Uh, not quite, no. Uh, you know, aero is a wonderful, wonderful deposit for sure. But Accio is definitely much different. What we like to believe that Accio will be is the next mine in the Athabasca. And I say that just because of our Athabasca 2.0 strategy. We realized, based on historic open pit deposits, from the discovery to production stage with those open pit deposits in the Athabasca, anywhere from six to 12 years. So we think that Accio, it being one of these type of discoveries, can meet those timeframes. So we're within our first year of drilling. I think that you know if if we can get to a resource by the end of the year, that's extremely hopeful and maybe a little bit too bullish on my end, which you know, we'll be able to assess by the time we're done drilling. If not this year, then pretty well guaranteed for next year, as we are we do have a lot of shallow drilling and we're drilling very quickly. We're seeing we're covering a lot of ground in in a very short time frame, so we can we can expedite those results. But if we can get to a resource as quick as possible and everything looks good, then we hope the economics behind it all are all there. And this is one of those discoveries that go from, from discovery into production within six to 12 years. That's all we can hope for. Well, James, I want to thank you for spending time with us today and sharing the baseload energy story and also sharing your thesis on this Athabascan Basin 2.0. I really enjoyed hearing that. It makes the story itself very unique. If any of our viewers would like any further information on baseload, please send us an email to info at blurstreetcapital.com or if you have any questions for James and his team, send us an email and we'll get you an answer. Once again, James, thank you. And thank you very much, James.
Hi, Phil. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Toronto? No, very well. It's been, we just had a, a hot streak here, uh, but otherwise it's great. Phil, you have a very interesting background in that you were both a research analyst and a banker before you became the CEO of Consolidated Uranium. And I want to discuss how this background has helped you form the company. Yeah, look, I think it's been uh, very constructive. So as you point out in my career, I've been both a sell side analyst, I've been an investment banker, I also worked at a fund on the buy side. And, and in all of those experiences, we spent a lot of time focused on uranium. What it meant is I got to know the companies very well. I got to know the teams involved in these companies very well. I knew what worked to finance companies and how to invest in the companies. And I knew a lot of projects. So in my career to this point, I would say I've been to over 100 projects around the world. I've got the map of all the uranium projects behind me uh, in my office here. And, and in, 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 in forming the business, we've taken a very much a boots on the ground approach to the acquisition of these projects. I've been to almost all of them that we've acquired to date and many other ones that we're looking at. How many projects have you visited over the years? Well, I would say it's, it's in excess of 100 and some of them would be minor projects, exploration projects, um, but, uh, but at least a dozen proper mines and development projects again, all over the world, probably in over a dozen countries. So you were also around for the first cycle in 2005, 2006. How is this one different from that cycle? Look, I think it's a, it's different in a few ways and, 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 in, and similar in a few ways. So similar in the sense that, that uranium had been in a, a prolonged bear market in advance of both of those bull markets. That bull market of 05, 06, 07, when the prices got up to $137 per pound, um, that was catalyzed by specific events, namely the Cigar Lake flood. And in that, at that, that time, there were very, there was a very small number of uranium companies. So when capital chased into this space, there was a limited number of names that they could go after. Then the name, the number of companies exploded. I think at the peak back then, there were about 400 different companies. That number has dwindled down dramatically post Fukushima in a 10-year bear market. Many, many of those companies uh, went, to, went to the wayside and changed their business into some other kind of commodity. And what happened, so what's happened is, uh, and a lot of money was raised in that cycle and spent on these projects. Now those projects are on the sidelines orphaned. And that's really how we started the company. We recognized that there were projects that, great projects with resources, with significant past expenditures sitting on the sidelines and that we could that we could pick up for pennies on the dollar. I think that this bull market that we're, you know, we've already seen a doubling in the uranium price since the bottom when we started this company. I think there's a lot of runway to go. And I think that, that the difference is um, there is uh, a, a real renaissance in the nuclear space that's happening. There's a lot more reactor growth coming. And I think people are realizing that that nuclear has a role to play in, in solving climate change. And more and more people are coming around to the to the thought that nuclear is going to be one of the solutions. And so the demand side is really there. And then on the supply side, this 10 year bear market of underinvestment and exploration development, lots of mines have been sh have been shut off. Uh, the supply side rep response will be slow. And so prices have to go dramatically higher to bring on new production. Interesting insights. Thank you. So I want to move on now and discuss consolidated uranium. You have a portfolio of 12 assets made up of near-term producers, developers, and explorer coasts. And in the interest of time, Phil, I want to focus on those assets which are close to production because this is going to give you the biggest bump to your valuation. Your most advanced project is called Tony M and it's located in the state of Utah. So why don't we just begin there with a brief overview of that asset? <clears throat> Sure, so that's the Tony M project. Uh, it has a significant resource base, historical mineral resource of over 11 million pounds of uranium. It was a past producing mine. It's produced over a million pounds to date and a tremendous amount of capital has been expended on the project. By in historic dollars, <clears throat> over $100 million between the underground development and the service infrastructures in place. Those dollar figures today would be much, much higher if we had to replace all of that. Of course, we don't. And, uh, and, and that gives us a tremendous advantage over some of our peers who have to start from scratch building a mine. Uh, we're currently drilling that project. We're, I think we're on our fourth hole of an eight hole program. 
to confirm those historic resources. The, the deposit was very, very well drilled in the past. Over 1.5 million feet of drilling, 6,500 holes have already been drilled into the project. So we're very confident in the resource. We're confirming it to put a 43101, current 43101 together. And ultimately we'll do a PA on that project. And another asset is called the Dineros mine, which is also in the state of Utah. And that was also a past producer. Can you just touch on this asset, please? Sure, S similar to Tony M, it produced about a million pounds. It was, it was the most recent deposit or mine in production in the portfolio. It was in production up until 2013 by Denison. Um, it will be the first one that we bring back into production. It's a dry mine. It was, uh, we know exactly where we have to go to access the, the ore. Um, we do think there's tremendous exploration potential here. <clears throat> Once the drills are finished at Tony M, they're gonna go to Daenerys and we've got a 15 hole program there planned to test for resource extensions. And, uh, and we think our, our geologists think it's very, very prospective to grow the resources there. Uh, and it can go into production very, very quickly at, for a low amount of additional capital. So I, I just want to clarify one thing. Dineros will be the first mine that goes into production? That's the current thinking, uh, simply because it was the last mine to shut down. <clears throat> because of the nature of the ore body, it's dry. It take, it's, it's not going to take a lot of additional development to open it back up and get into the ore zones. And what's the timeline associated with that? So, I mean, there's a couple of different ways to answer that question. The first is how long would it take functionally if we started, if we push the button tomorrow? And this is a, it's a couple of months. And, and one of the unique things about all of the three main projects that we acquired from Energy Fuels as part of this portfolio is they're fully permitted. So we can open them up immediately. Um, and so it'll probably take a couple of months to turn it back on. The question is when we're gonna make that decision and it's gonna be a function of some of the results that we get from these, this year's drilling and also uh, the market. So you just mentioned your relationship with Energy Fuels and I wanna to touch on that before, before we do that, Phil, I first wanna ask you about the state of Utah. It's not a state we hear often when it comes to mining, but how is it in terms of mining? Is it a mining, mining friendly state or is it like the state of California, which can be very prohibitive or is it more like Nevada, which is very progressive? Yeah, look, that's a great question. And, and for those of us that are in Utah, we think of it all the time and we know what a great jurisdiction it is, but it's not necessarily apparent to the outside investor who hasn't done the work. If you, uh, I would say it's on par with Nevada. It ranks very highly in the Fraser Institute, but, but on the ground, we know this to be the case. Is that this particular this part of the state in the southeast of, of Utah? It's a very, very mining friendly jurisdiction. They've been mining uranium, particularly in this part of the state, for decades. Uh, there's the energy fuels operating mill is down there, and so I think it I think it ranks very, very highly, and it's uh, it's one of the top jurisdictions I would say in the world, particularly for uranium mining. So earlier this year, you entered into a strategic alliance with Energy Fuels, and that alliance is comprised of three agreements. Can you just touch on those agreements and tell us how they benefit you? No, absolutely. And, and just to take a small step back, so we acquired all of these projects from Energy Fuels. As part of that transaction, Energy Fuels took stock in our company. This was not a, a situation where they were selling the assets and walking away. They really wanted to find a group who would shepherd these assets uh, properly, and that's how we arrived at the at the arrangement with them. But as part of that, we entered into these three agreements. So, you know, we talk about the share position. We have an investor rights agreement which governs their position in the company. It calls for them to have uh, someone on the board of the company. And so, Mark Chalmers, the CEO of Energy Fuels, came on the board. And Mark's a 40-year mining engineer, brings tremendous experience to the table, and knows these projects, of course, intimately. The other part of the agreement is the toll milling agreement. And this is a very unique piece for our company and, and there's tremendous value in it that just can't be summed up in how many pounds do you have in a project. But and what it means is that we can mine our projects and process the ore at White Mason Mill. We're the only company that has this toll milling agreement and the White Mason Mill is the only operable conventional mill in the US. So without access to that mill, you can't turn ore into yellow cake and thereby sell it into the market. So I think it's a distinct advantage for us. And if you ask Mark Chalmers, it's the best home milling agreement they've ever given a company. And quite frankly, it's the only toll milling agreement they plan to give to any company. And then the third part of the agreement 
is the operating agreement. And this is very important for us as well. And as a small company, when you take on these projects and you say, we're gonna move them into production, you obviously need a team to do that. So we've been building our own owner's team and we have a group uh, that's operating on our, our behalf in, in, in the state. But what we get access to under the operating agreement is the entire energy fuels team with all uh, for all the different disciplines, whether it's geology, mining, permitting, et cetera. We get to second them to our projects as we need. Of course, we pay them for that, but we get access to the team of people that have been around these projects for years. They produce them in the last cycle and they know exactly how to open them up again. So, so these three components, again, while they can't be measured in the same way that you can value a project based on the pounds or, or cash flow model, et cetera, they're of tremendous value to our company. So in addition to doing the deal with Energy Fuels, you were also busy spinning out another asset into a separately publicly traded company called Labrador Uranium. Why did you spin this asset out and can you just speak to how this has added value to the shareholders of Consolidated Uranium? Sure, yeah, so we spun it out because we found, uh, we so we acquired Morin Lake which is a historic resource, uranium and vanadium, in an exciting camp in the central mineral belt. The ground all around us was owned by Altius, and uh, we together decided to create Labrador Uranium to focus on explore, exploring this, this very large package of, of ground. And what we, what we realized was, as we're moving consolidated towards production and development of assets, we don't really wanna be in the exploration game. And so by creating a separate company with a separate management team and a dedicated exploration team, that was the right path for that, for that particular asset. And uh, I think it's, born, it's, it's become very successful in the sense that we were able to raise nearly $20 million of capital for that vehicle, just for close to $10 million financing, which the money will be focused on exploration there. And what we did is we distributed the shares of Labrador that we've got to directly to the consolidated shareholders, so each of our shareholders could benefit directly from the success of that business. And you still own some explore codes and also developers within your portfolio of 12 assets. Would you spin out some other assets within that portfolio? So look, we're always looking at ways to realize value out of the rest of the portfolio. We're not done consolidating additional projects, and we can talk about that in a second if you'd like. But in terms of what we have in the existing portfolio, uh, we're, we're definitely open to ideas and opportunities to spin out other assets, particularly because of the su success that we've had with Labrador. Uh, and we're, particularly if we can't realize value within the consolidated share price for all of these projects, which might be understandable, it might make sense to spin out some of the other ones. So let's move on to your balance sheet, Phil. How much cash do you have and how will you allocate this cash in the coming year? Sure. So. So we're well funded. We've got about $27.5 million in cash on the balance sheet to date. We've raised $50 million over the last two years. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're doing in the company, I think it's, it's obvious through this conversation, is we're moving from simply acquiring assets and sitting on them to actually advancing them by spending money on them. So we're spending money in, in the US on, on drilling those projects. We're also spending money in Argentina this year. So we'll be allocating a, a bit more capital towards the projects but we're still earmarking uh, a number of our dollars towards new acquisitions. And that puts us in very good position vis-a-vis uh, -vis our peers who might be going after some of the same assets, where, where, where if you have cash to put into a transaction, uh, I think you get to the front of the list. Phil, you brought up a very good point about having cash on the balance sheet and you and your team have done a few things here in the past year to unlock value or create value for your shareholders but you're still trading at a discount to many of your comps. How will you and your team close this valuation gap in the coming year? Yeah, so look, I think the job one is to, is to tell the story. The investment community needs to know what we have. The near-term producers in the uranium space trade at a premium valuation. We are a near-term producer, but we're not getting that premium valuation. And I think that's part of what we're doing here today and in other marketing efforts as we as we look to uh, increase exposure for the company. And I do think that that uh, that valuation gap will narrow. I think we'll also narrow as we complete the work on these on these projects and articulate our strategy around taking them into production. As we talked about potentially spinning out other assets, if we can't realize the value directly 
we might have to realize it indirectly by spinning out those assets which aren't getting properly valued. Um, so I think those are the those are the main ways that we're we're going to going to try to do it. Uh, but I do think that there's still some M and A opportunities that can also enhance value uh, if we find uh, the right projects that that fit within the existing portfolio. And when you say the right projects, does that what jurisdictions would those be in? So look, we we really like the mix of jurisdictions, and 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 we took this uh, portfolio approach for a reason. Uranium is is particularly hard commodity to develop, and if you're relying on the single asset in a single jurisdiction, no matter how good you think that jurisdiction might be, it could change overnight, and, and you don't have any real uh, really control over that. So we did diversify, and what we did is we is we looked around the world and we said, okay, what are the countries that are good mining countries? What are countries have uranium mines already? What countries are nuclear countries? And and when you checked a couple of those boxes, we focused on them. So by being in Canada, Australia, the U.S., we got exposure to those better jurisdictions. And uh, I think those will be the ones that we focus on. What it has allowed us to do is take on slightly higher risk jurisdiction or perceptionally higher risk jurisdictions like Argentina, for example, although we really like juris uh, Argentina as a jurisdiction because it's a nuclear country building out its fleet and wanting domestic sources of supply. It's also very prospective for uranium. But so I think what you'll see us do is we'll focus mostly on the jurisdictions that we're already in and maybe take in a new jurisdiction um, that meets those criteria and, and, and sort of fits with what we're already doing. Phil, let's move on now and discuss your shareholder base. Your single largest shareholder is Energy Fuels. How much do they own? And maybe you can just touch on some of your other shareholders. Sure. So Energy Fuels is sitting around 19%. And they do have pro rata participation rights in future equity financings to maintain their, their interest. And that comes under that investor rights agreement that we talked about a little while ago. Behind them, we have uh, a number of names that, that your, uh, your audience might be familiar with. Mega Uranium is a shareholder. They were one of the first uh, investors in the company and one of the backers from, from day one. The Satin Cove Fund is also an investor uh, and a disclosed investor. Um, and they participated in almost all of the financing rounds that we've done. And then behind that, we've, as I said, we've raised $50 million. It's largely institutional and it's investors that are both uranium focused funds and generalists and other resource funds all around the world in the US, Canada, Australia, and Europe. Uh, and I think we've got a very good and supportive shareholder base that want to want to continue to see us execute this business plan. Phil, as your name implies, you are a consolidator of uranium assets. And given the uranium price was up 40% on the year, it's still up 15% on the year in spite of this pullback. But how has this impacted your ability to buy new assets? So look, it, it's definitely made it a bit more competitive. Um, we always look at, at acquisitions on both an absolute and a relative basis. So, you know, we've moved up. Uh, and so asset prices have moved up and particularly for paying, paying with shares, you can justify it on a relative basis, but we do look at things on an absolute basis. Um, and I think we've been particularly good at buying, uh, buying well in terms of uh, low valuations uh, on a historic basis. Um, it's gotten a little bit more competitive, but I think with the, and when we, but we still have a very robust pipeline. And I think the counterparties recognize that doing, tra doing a transaction with us gives them exposure to this much broader portfolio, particularly the US near, near term production assets. So they're still ready to transact. Um, definitely pricing is becoming the, 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 the big kind of conversation. And as I said, Having some cash to add to the mix puts us in on a on a stronger footing. I do I I, I do think we're going to be continue to be very busy, but we're going to be just a little bit more selective, and uh, and 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 maybe we'll have to maybe we'll have to pause on some of the transactions that we're looking at when uh, because it's gotten a bit more competitive. Phil, as we wrap up, what can investors expect in terms of news flow from consolidated uranium in the coming weeks and months? Yeah, look, I think it's going to be largely focused on work project programs down in the U.S. and in Argentina. So, the, as I said, the drills are turning now in the U.S. and they'll be turning for the next few weeks. Um, and then more discussion around the plan to move those projects ahead toward production. Work, uh, there will be results from Argentina. And then I think it'll be on the M&A front. So either new acquisitions that we're working on or 
potential as we talked about if we if we decide that a spin out is the way to go you'll hear about that in the next uh next three to six months well that's a great overview of consolidated uranium and i want to thank you for making the time today phil to all of our viewers if you have any further questions for phil and his team by all means send us an email to info at bloorstreetcapital.com and we'll get you an answer to your question or if you would like some research on the company send us an email once again phil thank you Thank you. It's great talking. Justin, thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Southern California? It's my pleasure. Things are beautiful right now. This is probably my favorite month of the year um, in as, as far as weather goes is June. It's you wake up in the morning, it's foggy and cold. And by two in the afternoon, it's sunny and about 75 to 80 degrees. It's, it's unbelievable. I envy you. Justin, so much has transpired since the last time we spoke. The first half of the year has been a tumultuous one, to say the least. The S&P is currently down around 15%. Give or take, it was down 20%. Bitcoin's down over 30%. Gold is flat on the year, but uranium is still up 15% on the year. Many of the equities are still up on the year, in spite of what's happening in global markets. But they are well off their high. So I wanted to spend some time with you on valuations and how you and your team value uranium equities. But before we do that, why don't we first begin with a brief discussion on your uranium newsletter, which is called Uranium Insider. Just tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so Uranium Insider Pro is our, our premium uh, newsletter. We've been doing it since August of 2019. So we're coming up on three years here. Um, we built a pretty uh, significant and supportive community. I have a, a dedicated small team behind me. Um, including some very experienced uh, hedge fund manager in the in the resource space, and uh, it's been it's been just a wonderful experience so far. I think that our timing was fantastic in the launch, um, August of 2019, with the market really taking off in December of 2020. And what we do is we focus really, really in depth on the macro and the fundamentals of the space. So each month we put out a very thorough newsletter that has, you know, this last month was 40 plus pages and about 25 of that was fundamental macro information. And the reason that we do that is because the sector is unbelievably volatile and the movements can be just gut-wrenching in both directions. And uh, it's very, very easy to get shaken out of an investment that moves like this when you don't understand the fundamentals of it especially. So if you come in with a, a vague understanding of nuclear, especially especially um, if you're attracted to the space because of the unbelievable positive news flow that seems to be affecting the space over the past two years, um, then you, you kind of think that things should just move in one direction and, and one direction only, and that's just not how it works, and that's not never how markets work. But there's a lot of speculative fervor that comes in, and then they get shaken out because they don't really understand what's going on. And so we try to take all of the information that's swirling around in terms of fundamental news flow and distill it down into what matters and what matters for investors in the space. And so in, in addition to that newsletter, we have um, we have 10 focus list positions, um, that our focus list portfolio that's uh, hypothetical, just 100% 100 um, 100 accountable. And we limit our position sizing. Right now we have two half size positions and also an options uh, position. So we have technically 11 positions, but 10 companies. And so we we have our own process for determining the companies that we feel offer the biggest uh, potential in this market for various reasons. Um, so far, we've done extremely well. Our, our return to date from since inception is about 390%. Um, that's down from uh, about 450% at the peak. And uh, we did really well last year. We were up 122% for 2021. Um, this year so far, we're down maybe 5%, something in that in that range. So really not that bad, all things considered. Um, in addition to the newsletter, we put out a monthly members-only webinar. 
that's uh, usually about two hours long. We have a special guest in each webinar that typically is a representative of one of the companies that we own. That's usually a great experience. We take a lot of questions from our members for that process and um, get to really geek out and go in depth. And in addition to all of that, we have intra-month bulletins, the emails that we send out as needed based on either um, breaking news that affects the sector or potentially trade alerts, whether we're trading in or out of new positions. And I'm curious, your subscriber base, are they based all in the US, Canadians, Europeans? It's really a global subscriber base. Um, we have the, the largest percentage of our members is in the US, followed by Canada and the UK, Australia, and then you have um, you know Germany, France, Spain, and then from there, just all over the world. That's a great overview. I want to move on now. As you mentioned, you and your team also manage an investment portfolio focused on uranium equities. And given we've seen a significant pullback in global markets, I wanted to provide in investors with a methodology on how to identify value in the uranium sector and also prepare for the next big move up. We all know it's coming. So why don't we just start with uh, you and your investment criteria. What exactly do you look for before you make an investment? Sure. Um, well, we look for liquidity, first of all. We look for uh, we look into management pretty in depth. We like to understand um, the the capabilities and prior record in terms of what management has accomplished with previous companies or with this particular company in the past. Um, we we like to see a decent amount of skin in the game for the insiders at the company. We look at the share structure very closely. That's something that I think is really important especially with the smaller and mid-cap companies. Um, share structure is something that most retail investors overlook and that can drastically affect the way uh, that a stock moves. So, um, and of course we look at jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is very important. Um, jurisdiction can make or break a company. We like to own companies that are in jurisdictions that at least have some history of previously supporting uranium mining. That's pretty crucial. We don't really like to make bets on jurisdictions, even though a jurisdictional bet can potentially pay off huge if you own a company that's in an iffy jurisdiction and then they get approval, then you can see explosive moves, but the opposite is true as well. You know, there's there's very few things that can really cause um, an investment in a mining company to tank severely, if not go to zero, and jurisdiction canceling of a project is, is one of those things. So we, we don't like to gamble. Um, just generally speaking, we don't like to gamble. We like to bet on um, primarily developing companies, companies that do already have uh, some some type of positive looking asset or assets that have the potential of getting into production in a reasonable time frame. Those companies typically get some sort of re-rating by the market when they near or start to actually go into production. Um, and especially a company that maybe the market doesn't recognize as a potential producer and they move towards that production during a bull market. We love those types of stories. Um, so yeah, it's it's the asset, it's the management, it's the jurisdictions, it's the share structure, primarily those four things. And, and we give those different weightings depending on the company and depending on the jurisdiction, et cetera. So let's dive into each of those elements. And why don't we just start with your portfolio of 10 names and if you look at it from a producer, developer, explorer code point of view, what would be the breakdown between those three components? Um, it's it's primarily developers for us. Um, so producers, producers are typically, I mean, there's so few producers. I mean, there's just a couple of names that you can buy that are actually producing anything at all. Um, so, uh, but developers, I think, is kind of the sweet spot. And if you own explorers, it's probably wise to diversify greater than we would like to. I think that the, there's there's a sweet spot in terms of diversification as well. If you diversify too much, you might as well just own an ETF. Um, and the the uh, potential for outperforming that ETF if you're diversified pretty much like an ETF is pretty much zero. And so, um, but at the same time, if you under diversify, you expose yourself to uh, pretty significant individual company risks. And so that sweet spot for us is 10 positions and that's worked out well for us so far. Um, explorers just have much more risk and they of course have more upside potential. You can find a small exploration company that makes a discovery during a bull market, you can have explosive returns. 
but um, again, that tends to be somewhat of a gamble. Uh, you can you can gauge you can reduce the risk of that gamble by um, understanding geology by speaking with uh, the actual geologist that's working for the company by recognizing what they've done in the past. If it's there's a lot of explorers in the uranium space and then in the metal spaces, just generally speaking, that just keep a drill turning once or twice, you know, every single year, and they raise money every single year, and uh, and the management keeps getting paid, and you know the insiders keep getting their options, but you know it doesn't really do anything for shareholders over the course of a decade or longer. They just keep poking holes in the same ground, expecting different results, and so you have to just be wary of that. I think just taking a shotgun approach is not the way to go with explorers. I would, um, if it were me betting on explorers, I would drill down to maybe five different explorers and take, um, you know, a 20% position in each of those explorers in terms, by 20%, I mean, if you were to, if you were to allocate 10%, like our focus list portfolio into a single company, I would allocate, uh, you know, two or two and a half percent to an explorer. And, and not go much higher than that because the risks are there that they just keep, you know, they just keep drilling and find nothing. And you also mentioned jurisdiction is very important to you. What would be the top three jurisdictions in the world for uranium mining? The top three would probably be Namibia and Africa, um, Saskatchewan, Canada, and perhaps Wyoming and the United States are probably the top three. Um, obviously, not a lot of uranium being produced in Wyoming, but it's a very, very friendly jurisdiction for uranium production. And the actual the companies that are producing even you know just a few thousand pounds at this point, they are based in Wyoming in the states. And they also have strong support from their state government. Very strong, yeah. Uh, John Barrasso, the senator in Wyoming, has been a, a staunch advocate of nuclear and of uranium mining. Justin, I want to ask you now about valuations and how you value a producer versus a developer versus an explorer co. Do you use a net present value uh, formula or do you look at pounds in the ground or exactly what methodology do you use? Well, for producers, you know, like I already said, there's only a few companies that are actually producing. So you can actually do forward cash flow, you know, discounted cash flow models for producers and come up with a relative valuation number. Um, which is perfectly useful for a company that's currently producing, um, you know, and, and and you can actually look at their current cash flow and expected cash flow. The problem with that type of valuation model for developers is there's so many variables that are nearly impossible to estimate at this point to the to the to the tune that that type of valuation model is almost useless for a development project. Um, you know, even you can take a company like, let's say, Global Atomic, for example, who did um, who did a PEA recently uh, last year, and they were coming up with their expected forward cash flow based on $35 uranium. Now we're already at $50 uranium, and it's less than a year later. What are we going to be at the time that they come into production in terms of the cost of that uranium and that they can get on the market? In addition. What are we going to see in terms of their capex costs due to uh, supply chain problems, due to inflation, due to the cost of uh, diesel fuel, et cetera, et cetera? Those types of models are, in our opinion, almost worthless when it comes to development projects. So in order to gauge a valuation, you almost have to do it on a relative basis from uh, comparing companies to each other rather than trying to get you know, uh, an NPV or a forward cash flow on a company that may or may not ever actually produce. Even the development projects, it's like, okay, everything looks rosy on paper, but as you and I both know, you know mining is, is probably one of the hardest businesses in the world, and actually going from um, finding a deposit, which is hard enough, dealing with all of the red tape to actually produce a, uh, you know, a, a fissile mineral out of the ground, that radioactive element, uh, it's extremely difficult. It takes a very, very long time and there's unbelievable hurdles. So to expect that that's going to happen without running into problems is uh, naive. But with all of that said, you can at least take um, relative valuations from company to company and say, okay, well, you have this many pounds in the ground. You can expect to be producing this much uranium. If we value uranium at the same price for both comparative valuations, then you can say, okay, this company is undervalued, this is overvalued relative to each other without knowing, okay, what if these guys are able to sign contracts 80, 90, $100 two years from now 
what does that look like to their bottom line? And now how does their valuation look um, relative to where they're at now? So that type of valuation um, is, is, is useful. You can also look at historical valuations, okay? So just to put some perspective, Cameco, uh, no, let's, let's look at Denison here. So Sprott put out a, an analysis of the uranium space in 2007. This is February 2007. This is four months before the peak of the market, okay? So Denison Mines, <clears throat> that was, they were just over a $2 billion uh, market capitalization at the time. And they were trading at, and this is a, an EV to pounds on the ground. So their enterprise value, their market cap minus cash plus debt relative to their measured and indicated resource. So not even just like the proven out 43101, but measured and indicated, okay? They were trading at $21.42 per pound. That was Denison. How much were they producing at the time? Zero. They were not producing any cash flow at the time and they were trading at 22 bucks a pound, okay? Then we'll take another company. I'm not gonna say who it is. This is a development company. We actually own it. They are actually currently cash flowing. They have a pretty good resource. They expect to be producing uranium in 2025. They're trading at $2 a pound in the ground right now. And so that the pound in the ground valuation is iffy at best, but you can at least use it to make a relative uh, comparison between companies and between now and the peak of the previous market. So if that gives you any sense of how crazy valuations can get, um, then, then there's some significant upside potential still in this market, in my opinion. I'm glad you brought up the Denison valuation from 2007 because I want to ask you about that last cycle. And when you look at it, this cycle compared to the one we saw back in 06, 07, when uranium got up to $150 a pound, what's the big difference? The big difference between the two cycles? Yes. Oh gosh, there's there's quite a few differences. Um, I would say the biggest difference right now is that we actually do have a supply deficit that didn't exist in the previous market. Um, the previous market ran up for a couple of reasons. There were a couple of catalysts that led to potential supply disruption. Those were primarily floods at both Cigar Lake and MacArthur River. Um, and then you had financial speculation that came into the space and really moved the price up. So the utilities at the time never really ended up paying more than $100 a pound. And there were a couple of utilities that did sign contracts around that $100 a pound mark and they never lived it down. You know, it was it was almost a career killer. And so um, utilities have a memory of that, and that's one reason why they haven't voluntarily stepped up to the plate over the past few years, even with this supply deficit current and looming going out in the future to sign contracts at a higher price than what they could get through carry trades and spot market and buying from the Kazakhs, et cetera. So that's the, kind of the biggest difference is we actually have a significant supply shortage right now um, that will slowly be reduced with the um, uh, the restart of both MacArthur River and uh, Paladin's Langer Heinrich over the next two to three years. Um, but then from there, it, the alligator jaws widen again, and it goes back to a, a potentially severe supply deficit out towards the, at the end of the decade. So that's a really big difference. Um, let's see, another big difference is we have we have a large idled fleet of nuclear reactors in Japan that is set to come back online. So that didn't exist in back in 2006, 2007. That was mainly a, a China growth story and um, perceived supply interruptions that really moved that market in the big way. Once the, once the, once the commodity started to recover to a relative, um, you know, that marginal cost of production level, which at the time was probably in, in the 50s, um, beyond that was all supply shock and uh, market speculation. And so now we have, we have this fleet of uh, 30, 30, let's see, 33 reactors, 10 have been restarted. So there's another 23 reactors that can be restarted in Japan in relatively short order. That's a big, big um, bump in demand that's potentially near term. Now, Japan is wanting to wanting to get to 20 to 22 percent nuclear by 2030, which is another 20 reactors restarted. And so we're seeing actual now the new president of Japan come out as a vocal supporter of restarts. Now, Japan is they don't have a lot of natural resources, so all of their energy output they have to import 
um, coal, they have to import natural gas, they have to import uranium. The big thing with uranium is A, they still have a decent amount of inventories. So the utilities that do still have reactors that can be uh, brought back online have some fuel that they can that they can utilize going into those reactors. Um, and B, uranium is so unbelievably concentrated that for Japan to have a 20% of their of their grid go back to nuclear, you know, they can store a decade's worth of energy resource in a, in a single warehouse. You know, it's so concentrated that it, it really makes sense for them. So that's a really big difference. And then of course, sput is probably the third thing that's the biggest difference. It's a it's a, a physical trust that's run by you know the player in the resource financial space, and um, they have an ATM. And so now you have this vehicle that financial players can can own uranium without having to hold uranium on their books by owning trust units in the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, have exposure to the commodity. It's very it's highly liquid. Uh, and you know, you know, when the when the trust is trading above one percent to premium to NAV, half of the money coming into that thing is going to buy physical uranium. So it's it's a pretty unique setup across the board. And but when you look at the mar this cycle compared to the last cycle from a valuation point of view, there's so much more upside associated with this market that we find ourselves in right now, even in spite of what's happened here in, in the last few months. It's true, yeah. So that the, at the peak of the previous market, it topped out at about 100, 100, oh gosh, 140, 150 billion market cap, something in that range. And right now we're right around 30 billion. Um, to give you another relative valuation uh, metric here, this also came from that Sprott document from 2007. So 2007, um, February, Cameco was at 16.6 .6 billion in market cap. They peaked out at 24 billion. So they made a move from 16 billion to 24 billion in four months. That was that last big leg of the market, right? So if you adjust for inflation, 24 billion, that's about 29 billion right now. Cameco currently is sitting at about a 10 billion valuation. So for for us to even go back to that type of level, we're looking at a potential, you know, you know, 3x in the largest cap company in the space. Um, so it, you know, if if the large caps can do a two to three x, you know, the mid caps can do even more than that. The small caps, who really knows? You know, it's kind of the sky the sky's the limit. Um, on top of that, we have a backdrop that's unbelievably positive for re-embracing of nuclear. So that's kind of unique. It's, there's this this upswell of positive sentiment, not only because of concerns about climate change and, and decarbonizing grids, but also just the energy crisis that's that's hitting the entire world right now and that's only getting worse. So that's underpinning all of this. And you know, then just you just look at financial markets and look at the money flow now compared to 2007. Um, it's it's got to be two to three x in terms of the actual amount of money that's swirling around the world in institutional uh, in investment markets. And so the potential to to breach that 150 billion market cap is definitely there. And it all has to do with, you know, how much we're going to see a rotation of money from, um, from, you know, overvalued tech growth stocks and into into value stocks and commodities. And and we're only, you know, we're only a year and a half into that rotation. These commodities runs they can last a decade. So we're we're still potentially in very early innings for this thing. Well, that's good news. Justin, I want to thank you for making the time today. It was a great overview of what's happening within the uranium sector. It's always very enlightening when we speak with you. I would remind our viewers to check out Justin's website and YouTube channel, Uranium Insider, and also his newsletter. There's a link below. He provides a daily update on what's happening in the sector, and I would highly recommend it. Once again, Justin, thank you. My pleasure, Jimmy. Happy to be with you again. Hi, Tim. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Saskatoon? Hey, Jimmy. Uh, things are going great. Thanks for having us. It's uh, it's summer here, although we've got a little bit of rain going on, which if out here in Saskatchewan, that's always a great thing for, for the farmers. So yeah, we're doing really well. Thanks. Tim, you and your team have had a very busy first half of the year, completing your winter drilling program, getting ready for the upcoming drilling season, and working toward a resource on your hurricane deposit. 
And before we discuss all of these events in more detail, why don't we just begin with a brief overview of ISO Energy for those viewers who might not be familiar with the company. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, listen, we're, we're a Saskatoon-based uranium junior. Um, we were put together in 2016 as a spin out of NextGen. At that time, obviously, the, you know, kind of a tough time in the market. We, we picked up five properties in the eastern Athabasca Basin from, from NextGen. And since that time, we've, we've taken advantage of what has been a down market to pick up more properties. We, we now have 24 properties in the portfolio, uh, our flagship property is the, is the hurricane uh, zone, which is located on our La Rock East property. Tim, as you just mentioned, your flagship property is the hurricane zone in La Rock East. Can you just provide us with an overview of this property, please? Yeah, um, you know, so we, we are very fortunate to have that property. It's a property that didn't come in the original package. We picked that up in 2018. We bought it in, in May of that year, um, sunk one hole at the end of a program uh, in the summer in July, came up with mineralization, and since then it's been it's really been the focus of of most of ISO Energy's activities. Uh, we've completed six drill programs there. Uh, we've struck a lot of very high grade mineralization over the last few years, and and, and created what we call the hurricane zone. And um, we we continue to move that that forward. We're we're doing a lot of work over the last few years to try to define the size and scope of that deposit and 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 uh and having done a lot of that work already we're also uh, spending some time on some of our other properties these days as well and tim when it comes to the base and depth is a very important element as it translates into better economics the more shallow it is can you just speak to this please yeah sure i mean you know in the basin there's a lot of things that provide you a strategic advantage and you know luckily um, ISO Energy and, and the hurricane deposit in, in general, um, you know, kind of hit the mark on a lot of those things. So, we, like I said, our strategy before was to really focus on the eastern Athabasca Basin, and that is the home to a lot of the infrastructure, whether it's roads, power, um, even mills. Um, those are strategic advantages. And then, you know, then then you look at, you know, what are the advantages of, of the deposit? Obviously, grade, but depth is a big one as well because, um, you know, the, the basin does get, you know, Deeper as you go in further, and, and to the extent you can you can have a deposit that's you know within a reasonable distance from the surface that just helps with economics. So yeah, we're we're about 325, 330 meters below surface, and we're you know a sandstone hosted unconformity deposit, and very similar to um, you know a Cigar Lake, a Phoenix, um, in that same sort of depth. In fact, we're probably a little bit shallower than some of those very successful deposits, and that obviously just bodes well for the future. When it comes to determining the success of a deposit and growing it into a resource and taking it to a feasibility study and beyond, infrastructure is always very important. You just touched on that, but maybe you can just expand on it. Uh, how close are you to Sagar Lake, for example? Yeah, you know, we're not we're not too far from Sagar Lake, and and really the advantage for ISO Energy is that means we're not too far from McLean Lake. Um, so yeah, like I said, we're really in the heart of all the infrastructure in the basin, which really just obviously makes uh, a lot of the economics that much better, makes it easier when you're making decisions to transition from a deposit to, you know, how do you move it forward? Um, we're only 40 kilometers from McLean Lake. McLean Lake does do all the all the milling for a Cigar Lake project. There's a road there. We don't have a road to McLean Lake, but but we're very close. And, you know, down the road, um, I think it's it's well known that McLean Lake uh, has excess capacity there, even even doing the Cigar Lake or and down the road, they as Cigar Lake you know transitions you know out of the supply picture down down the road you know a decade or wherever whenever that is, McLean Lake will have capacity. So you know to be a, a, a developer, a, a, an explorer that has a project that's near an existing mill in northern Saskatchewan, it's quite rare actually, and so that it gives us a real uh, strategic advantage down the road. We hope. So one thing I want to ask you about this property, you said you did acquire it in what year? Yeah, we picked it up in 2018. And you acquired it from Cameco. We did. And I guess my question to you would be if if this property has so much promise, why yeah. would Cameco have sold it? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I, you know, I think it just speaks to where we were in the, in the industry. Like if you think of 2016 when we were formed and 2018 when we were still picking up properties, the reason we were able to pick up properties is because there was not much going on in northern Saskatchewan or the, you know, the nuclear industry in general as far as growth. And, you know, so Cameco is, is an enormous land package. There's certainly been work done on the project in, in other areas. And, you know, I think, you know, for a company like that, they just have to make decisions on which properties they focus on, which they, they let go. And, and, you know, the benefit for us was that they let go of one that, that we liked and, and uh, had, some, had some great geologists that, that just maybe took a little different approach uh, than had been done before. And, and that's typically how it happens. Somebody comes in and, and maybe, you know, sinks a hole somewhere that, you know, somebody hadn't been focusing on before and, and we were fortunate to find Hurricane. So another interesting aspect of this story is the fact that the hurricane zone actually borders on another property, which is owned by Cameco in Orano. Yeah. Can you just expand on this? Have they done any work on that property? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, our our property right is on the border of the Cameco Orano Don Lake project. Um, in fact, if you look at our, our our website and our our presentation on there, you'll see that the high grade zone you know, really does end right on the border. So it's it's very clear that there's probably something on the other side and that 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 property is owned by Cameco and Arano. Um, you know, when I started in this role a year and a half ago, I don't, I don't think there was a lot of work going on there, but, you know, um, we've been, well, it's been great to see that in the last uh, six months or so, they have turned some attention uh, to Don Lake. So I think back in the summer, we we understood they were doing some geophysics and in this winter, you know, we were up drilling this winter and, and and they had a team in there doing some drilling on the other side. So, you know, I don't have any information on what that resulted in. But, you know, for us, it, it's a great story because if we don't own it, I mean, obviously that would be great if we had picked up that property. But um, the next best thing is for someone to do the work and and complete the story, complete the picture for us to know, um, you know, we've got a great, great project going on. But is there is there more on the other side? And if there is, then that just that just helps uh, create a more interesting picture down the road. So I wanna move the discussion now toward your drilling campaign. You've had a very extensive 16,000 meter drilling campaign last summer, and that was followed by a 12,000 meter campaign this past winter. Can you just provide an overview of some of these results? Yeah, I mean, you know, this winter, we really continued to focus on the Rockies and Hurricane. Uh, Hurricane is really, you know, a small little corner of the Rockies property is a big property. So we certainly continue to do some drilling on the rock to, or on hurricane to, you know, we've been trying to, you know, figure out what are, what's the border, as I mentioned before, what's the scale and scope of this deposit. Um, so we've been doing big step outs to try to find those edges, you know, I, I'd call it. Um, so we did that work, but we also, uh, in the previous summer, uh, we did a lot of geophysics up to the far east of the rock east. And so there's about a 15 kilometer uh, 15 kilometers worth of conductor out to the east of of Hurricane and up uh, up to the northeast on the property, and so we spent a lot of time and a lot of uh, a lot of drilling uh, to start to to tap into some of those targets that we identified uh, the past summer. So we spent a lot of time there. That was a good portion of our of our winter program, along with some other geophysics as well. And Tim, why don't you just touch on some of the results that you found in the from the drilling campaign? I'm talking about the grades. Well, I mean, the rock um, east and you know the hurricane de depositor zone itself is always um, has always returned some great some great grades. So yeah, we've been very fortunate as we've as we've developed that project and and we've and we've got some results that we've come up with very high grade mineralization and and that's that's continued. I mean, um, we've we've reported you know mineralization up to you know, 70 plus percent over, you know, three and a half meters. And, and there's a lot of examples of that through the deposit, um, very high grades and, and um, all concentrated in, you know, fairly small area that you'll see if you, if you look at sort of the drawing of our, of our, uh, of our deposit, you know, on our presentation. But yeah, you know, we're very fortunate. That's, that's what you want to find when you're in Northern Saskatchewan. It's, it's the home of these deposits that have, you know, uh, 50, 100 times the world average. And certainly, um, hurricane uh, fits the bill with with results that you know some of the some of the mineralization certainly in that in that order of magnitude. And Tim, how would these results compare to what you might find at Cigar Lake? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're 
good deposits in the in the basin are, are are similar in a lot of ways. I mean, Cigar Lake is is comparable in that it's a sandstone, you know, unconformity hosted deposit, you know, located in the in the sandstone, you know, close to the to the basement rock. Um, and that's you know that's similar to us. Phoenix is kind of the same. Denison's projects, it's it's uh, you know unconformity hosted deposit, and 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 all these projects, you know, if they're successful, you know, as we talked before, they're they're probably at a certain depth uh, to make sure that you can get access economically, and and they all have very high grades. And um, certainly, Cigar Lake is you know it's got a very uh, technical mining method with the jet boring, and that, and that you know it's a it's a low cost mine, but that's an expensive you know, mining method. And so you, you need, you need those grades and you need the size of something like Cigar Lake to make it, make it viable. Um, you know, Phoenix is a little different. It's, it's not as big. So, you know, Denison is, is looking at, at, at uh, leveraging those grades by using ISR mining in, in the base and the first, the first folks to, to attempt to do that. So, yeah, I mean, grades are, grades are important. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, depth is also a, a big advantage. So let's talk about your current drilling campaign. What do you have planned for this summer? Yeah, um, we're getting back up. You know, North, we had a great, you know, program this winter. It was a tough, it was a tough winter program. Our, our team did a great job, you know, getting through some really tough conditions. I mean, it's always tough in northern Saskatchewan. I think this year was maybe tougher than than most. Um, they're they're excited to get back up. They're planning for, you know, some more drilling, a little bit of drilling at, at Hurricane. Um, more drilling up to the to the east on the La Rock East uh, property, and then and we're also going to tap into a couple other projects. We did some drilling last summer on Geiger. Uh, we did some geophysics to follow up uh, on that this winter, and so we'll we'll use that information to to uh, create some some new targets or have created new targets on Geiger to go after, and uh, and we'll also get up and do a little bit of drilling at a property called Trident um, that we've we've had and and haven't done any work on. Um, since since we uh, well we haven't done any drilling on that on that property yet so we'll do that um, we'll follow it up with we've got a fair bit of airborne uh, surveying that we're going to conduct as well on a few other projects and that of course will just set us up for future future programs down the road. Tim, I want to move the discussion toward your balance sheet now. How much cash do you have, and how will you allocate that cash in the coming year? Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, we're in pretty good shape still. We've got just over 8 million Canadian in the bank. Um, and despite, you know, the, a little bit of a tough market, generally, uh, the Iranian market still seems to have some good legs. And I mean, there seems to be access to capital out there if you need it. Um, we also have a couple of marketable securities that, that we have in the books. We own uh, right around 14% of 92 Energy and, and, and some shares in consolidated uranium. And, and so with that, we probably have another, you know, seven, seven and a half million dollars of of equities on the balance sheet that you know provides us some backstop as well. Um, yeah, we'll you know we're in good shape to cover all of our summer program with the cash on hand and get us through the year. And uh, if and when you know uh, we need to go to the market to raise raise more capital, we'll make that decision you know at uh, at the time that's best for for ISO Energy and and its shareholders. Tim, you recently attended the World Nuclear Fuel Market Conference in Montreal. It's an annual conference that yeah. aim, is aimed at utilities. And I'm curious why you as an Explorer Co. would go there. Yeah, it's aimed at utilities, but also it's really um, a, a nuclear fuel cycle conference. So, you know, there's a lot of big nuclear conferences, the World Nuclear Association, um, you know, others that really have a, a wide variety of topics right from, you know, uranium, exploration to enrichment to see it you know ESG to new reactors really the WFM is is kind of an independent organization they put on this conference and they really focus on uranium conversion enrichment sort of the front end of the cycle fabrication and you know there's so much going on in the in the in the world right now on the on the uh, on the uranium front in the nuclear fuel front that it's it's worth to keep your your ear to the ground so you know we've got a great market ahead we believe and and that's been strengthening. And then, you know, over the last year, we've had all these these events, whether it's Sprott coming in and buying 30 plus, you know, million pounds of uranium in a short period, a um, little bit of, you know, problems in Kazakhstan that created people, you know, got people thinking a little bit about the risk of that, you know, part of the world. And then, of course, the big one has been Russia and, you know, that terrible situation there, which um, Russia is a huge supplier to the to the West, to the U.S., to Europe. And that's having, you know, huge impacts right now, uh, just causing a lot of consternation on where 
um, if and when that supply goes away, and, and, and I think there's probably not much discussion, it will go away at some point, you know, where does that come from in the short term? Um, our industry moves very slowly uh, a lot of the time, you know, almost at a glacial pace, and, and to have a big impact, you know, impact event like that, which will require new fuel um, quickly, it's not something we're, we're really, you know, too familiar with. So a lot of interest on where's, you know, uranium come from, but also those other pieces of fuel cycle, conversion especially, and enrichment, uh, you know, you need those those pieces in order to create the nuclear fuel, and and, and they're limited unless people invest more money and, and create more create more output. So yeah, there's just lots going on in the industry uh, to just like I said, keep your ear to the ear to the mat and make sure you know what's happening in the in the fuel cycle and where the opportunities are and when where where the problems are at the moment and and maybe in the future. And even though you're an Explore Co, would utilities want to meet with you to discuss future production possibilities? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, utilities have always been interested in, in keeping it, uh, an eye on what's out there, who's who's got what projects. Um, but yeah, you know, typically not so interested in Explore Co's. You know, we're in an interesting position. Um, you know, we you know we've got a, a deposit that we believe is is really world class in many ways, and so. Yeah, utilities are interested these days more than ever to to understand you know which juniors are out there which projects they have who can be you know you know which which horse do you kind of or do you kind of you know you know attach yourself to you know down the road as far as you know who's got the most likelihood of, of bringing on new production so you've got you know people are certainly willing to talk to the next gens uh, who obviously we're closely aligned with you know we're still 50 percent owned by by next gen so we're you know, we're we're very closely aligned to those folks, and and I, you know, I've got a marketing background, and I, I keep my ear to the ground for the next gen folks as well. And you know, we um, these utilities are are like I said, their their views are changing a little bit. I think they they realize they they need to understand where not you know where the production is coming from, not just five years out, but probably ten and beyond, and and who those people are. Tim, as we wrap, Bob, can you summarize what we can expect in terms of news flow from ISO Energy in the coming weeks and months? Yeah, like I said, we're you know we're planning our summer program. Uh, we're about to get out there in July, so we'll certainly share you know more details on what's what's going on there, what we're going to be doing, a little more detail around it. Um, you know, and and we're also like I said, we've been doing step outs on Hurricane. We've been trying to determine the size and scope of that of that project, and so. You know, over over the time, you know, weeks and months to come, we'll certainly be looking at, uh, you know, how to how to you know continue to advance that project, and and that'll include, you know, making a decision on putting out a you know a maiden resource and all that good stuff, and and uh, and sharing more and more information with with uh, the market, you know, as soon as we can. So, yeah, just just more of the same, and and we'll also, like I said, we'll be spending more time, given that hurricanes, you know, we've had a lot of exploration on hurricane, but it's also now time to turn our attention to some of these other great projects that have been sitting on the sidelines. We will have uh, you know, more and more great news as we start to do more work on those projects. Well, Tim, that was a great overview of ISO Energy, and I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. To any of our viewers, if you would like some more information on ISO Energy or if you would like some research on the company, send us an email to info at floorstreetcapital.com, and we'll send it along. Tim, once again, thank you. Jimmy, it's a pleasure. Thanks a lot for, uh, for your time. Hi, Stephen. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Toronto? They're great. Rainy, but great. But PDAC is coming, so it's spring in the mining sector. So we're pretty happy to be here. Thanks, Jimmy. Lots to look forward to. Steve, Labrador uranium is unique for a uranium explorer coal because it, it is in Canada, but it's not in the Athabasca Basin, but rather it's in Labrador. And Labrador is a mineral rich area, but it is not associated with uranium. But there is a well known uranium deposit there that many people might be familiar with, and that's the Michelin deposit that is now owned by Paladin. 
And I want to spend a few minutes on both Labrador and also the Michelin deposit just to reinforce the importance of Labrador as a mining jurisdiction and also to speak to the Michelin deposit and just the sheer size of this uranium deposit. So why don't we just start there? Okay, great, great. And it's a good question. You got to start with the context. So look, Labrador is a great jurisdiction. There are world-class deposits there. For example, Valley's Voises Bay, which I think almost everybody knows knows about. It's just basically a giant rock of nickel. Um, you've got Carroll Lake, which is um, <clears throat> Rio Tinto's iron ore deposit there as well. The Fraser Institute considers Labrador to be uh, the eighth best mining investment jurisdiction in the world. Um, we've got an area here along the central mineral belt um, where there are dozens of known occurrences and historical deposits. So, you know, we, as you mentioned, at the far east end of this belt is Paladin's plus or minus 120 million pound Michelin deposit, uh, which sits right at surface, which anchors this district. In the last uranium boom, we had multiple discoveries of uranium in this area. Um, no one had ever gotten to that size just because they'd never been able, they had not been able to spend that kind of money. But we're also looking at dozens of known occurrences of copper, molybdenum, all sorts of minerals in this belt. It's an exciting region. It's it's where four different basically orogenic or mountain building events have occurred. So we have incredible amounts of both structure and different types of fluids that have come up here that have, have made this a very rich area. Um, but no one's consolidated into a single piece like we have. And nobody's really been able to like, you know, most of the guys historically have, it's been prospecting and smaller work, but not the same level of work as we hope to do. Uh, it did see that in the last uranium boom though. Um, and so in, in, in the late, you know, 2007 to 2011 period, we did see a lot. So as you said, you know, you got what's now Paladin's Michelin deposit, um, greater than hundred million pounds. At one point, uh, Aurora, which was bought by, by Paladin, was worth about $1.3 billion based on this asset. Um, and so, so look, this is an exciting area. It, you know, and look at it this way. Michelin in 2011 was acquired by Paladin for $261 million. And that was at a time when Labrador had a, a moratorium on uranium development. So they still saw this massive value, uh, which we see in this district as well. And now that that moratorium is gone, um, the, the local governments are very much on board with, with uranium development. Um, we, we have this great opportunity because we've been able to consolidate this belt in this amazing jurisdiction. I can't believe Paladin had a market cap of 1.2 billion. I guess those were the good old days. Well, and that was, that was Aurora that had that. Paladin bought that thing, right? So yeah, it was, uh, and it was incredible to watch. Like if you look at, we, we've got a case study, but like, if you look at it, Every time they drilled, they just kept adding value. Now it helped that the uranium price kept going up as well, but it was uh, it was exciting to watch from sort of 2007 to 2010. Well, that's a great overview of both Labrador and also the Michelin deposit. I want to move on now and discuss Labrador Uranium. It's a relatively new company, having just started trading in the March of this year. It's comprised of assets from LTS Consolidated Uranium and also mega uranium you have two assets Morin Lake and also Mustang Lake and why don't we just start with the larger of the two and that's Morin Lake it already has a historic resource of 20 million pounds so just provide us with a brief overview of this asset please sure so look Morin Lake is it's our core asset for now mostly because we have a lot of earlier stage exploration to look at in this in this belt that we have which is over 130,000 hectares um, so at Morin Lake, you know, in the last uranium cycle, the previous owners spent about $25 million on this target, and they were able to get it to about a 20 million pound uranium equivalent. That ends up being about 10 million pounds of U308. And, you know, if you look at, this is indicated and inferred and it's historical, but, and, but another significant piece of that resource is vanadium. It's about, a, it's over 110 million pounds of, of uranium as well, of vanadium, sorry, as well. Um, so this is a deposit that comes to surface. Um, so it, 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 it is open pitable. It, it is, but it also has deep targets around it. So this is open at depth. It's open a long strike. So in a brief period of time, 
Uh, with $25 million, someone was able to cobble together a great starter resource. Um, but we're excited about it because we think this grows significantly, which is one of the reasons we bought or, or put together with, with Altius and our other partners, this land package around it. Because um, if one looks at the targets and what we found both with copper and uranium, it really looks like this extends to the northeast and southwest of where we are. Um, and it has not been fully tested. In this area, though, again, in the last year, we did have several people working, and in and around it, there's smaller deposits. So our goal is to find out, is this one large, significant deposit, which we think it can be, um, there's enough stuff in the area telling us that it can be that. It could potentially be multiple smaller deposits. We're happy with that as well, as long as it's at surface and they're, and they're near a sort of central hub. So it's our main target for our 2022 field season. We're going to drill about 4,000 meters there. Uh, it's our first time with it, so we need to do con some confirmatory drilling to, to see what that historical resource is. Uh, but the main goal is to grow is to grow that resource. If it sits where it is at you know plus or minus 20 million pounds uranium equivalent, that'll never be a mine. The grades in this area and the access in this area are not do not allow for that size to be a mine. So it is our job to turn this into something larger. Uh, we're looking for Michelin size deposits in this area at surface. Um, we do have an advantage with both this target and a lot of what we're looking at, at, at in the central mineral belt, which is that not only does it come to surface, but it, there's other commodities that come with it. So that vanadium helps a lot because it makes up for really anything else you find. Like if we find copper in this area in, in these deposits as well, um, you know, depending on how you work the map, it just lowers your operating costs or increases your revenue coming out of your deposit. It makes them more uh, buildable, frankly, more economic. Um, and again, the vanadium is neat because it's also an energy metal, right? You're looking at vanadium flow batteries, that sort of thing. So um, we're very excited about Mustang, <laughs> Morin Lake, sorry, I, uh, the two M's don't help. We're very excited about Morin Lake. We do believe it grows significantly. And like what happened at Michelin, um, you know, part of that deposit, what's fascinating is, is, is the owners that had it before uh, Paladin, they started with a small project that was about 30 million pounds. And they just kept drilling and they kept growing it and growing it and growing it. And our goal is to do the exact same thing. It'll take some mine, money, it'll take some time, but we think it's there and, and now we just have to we have to go and prove it and see what that is so you did touch on grade and you mentioned it's low grade maybe you can just touch on that and also just provide an explanation of how it might compare to what we might find in the basin so look this is not a high grade basin and that's something that's really important for investors and other people to understand so in the basin you know in saskatchewan you're getting above one percent you get very high grade uranium deposits um, some of which you don't even want human beings around, right? Um, this, very, this basin is very different. So Michelin itself is a little over 800 ppm, so 0.08%, right? Um, in our area, we're looking, if you just look at the uranium alone, it's about 350 ppm, so you know, even more below that. So the, these deposits require a few things that are different from what you're seeing in the basin. You really need them to be at surface right? Um, because this will not be economic at depth. You know, at, at a certain point as you're drilling this thing, there's no point to go further and further and further uh, at depth, at least just for the uranium at these grades. Um, you know, as, as, as an aside, um, there are a lot of very interesting looking targets that are deep, that look like they this re region has a lot of potential for IOCG style deposits. So you get iron ore, copper, gold, which comes with the uranium, like you see in, in, in some of the bigger deposits like in Australia. Um, but that's a secondary point. Um, so we need, we need for these to work, they need to be large bulk tonnage at surface projects or, or there's no point. And they are there, right? We've already seen that with what's happening with, with, with the Michelin deposit. What you see at Michelin is not dissimilar. Look, the rock type is different. It's harder and less accessible. But what's being built by Paladin right now at Langer Heinrich has a very similar size and grade. So these grades are mineable. There are many mines in areas like Kazakhstan that are even lower grade, much lower grade. Um, but again, it's, it, you need bulk tonnage and you, you need size and you need, and you need service. 
So that's a great overview of Moran Lake. Let's move on to your second asset, Mustang Lake, which was acquired from Mega Uranium. Why don't you provide us with a little bit of background on this asset? Excellent. So look, we knew we were going to buy Mustang from day one, but it took us a little while to close. So we only closed it in the last month. Um, came with a few great things, but fundamentally, um, this is a, a, a target that we already know there's uranium there. They hit uh, over nine meters of uranium at 0.12%, so greater, a higher grade than what you see at Michelin right now, and, and what definitely higher than what we have at uh, Moran Lake. Um, it's nine and a half kilometers northeast of Michelin. It's actually between Michelin and Jacques Lake, which is another deposit up there. There are three prospects within Mustang itself. We have, as I said earlier, known uranium intersects, but there's also potential for IOCG mineralization there as well. This area has the highest lake sediment values anywhere in the area, like in the in the Michelin Jacques Lake region. Um, and so it, it behooves us to, to, to look further. The last drill hole, interestingly enough, that they drilled at Mustang ended in mineralization, but they had to pull. They lost the hole. It was winter drilling. It got kind of sketchy, so they had to pull the hole. So there's a lot that isn't yet known here. Uh, but what we like, it's it's very similar, if not the same rocks as as you see at the Michelin deposit. We know we have uranium down hole. There are multiple targets in the area, and it's been underexplored. So we think there's a lot to be done here. So in 2022, you know, we're going to get this site ready. We'll do some line cutting. We'll run some radiometrics this summer for a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, and then and then see where we come up with our new drill targets for for the coming year. But yeah, it's it's pretty exciting. It's it's you know, it's not the biggest deposit we have, but uh, the location and, and and knowing that there's uranium down hole is, 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 you know, we're pretty happy with that. We started this conversation highlighting the Michelin deposit. Now let's tie it all together. It's all part of this, it's all part of the same trend, but what you, you mentioned that the distance from Michelin to Mustang is nine and a half kilometers. How far is Morin Lake to Michelin? So I'd say, and I don't, I, I should know that better, but I'd say it's about 70, 75 kilometers. Um, the belt that we control, the central mineral belt, our entire district is about 125 kilometers. So it's a it's a beast what we what we've held on to here. And, and again, the majority of that was put together by by Altius. You know, in the, in that in that time when you know they put the moratorium on uranium and then the uranium prices fell out of bed, all the explorers left this basin. But happily, the guys we did the deal with at Altius. In the intervening period said well we know there's a lot here there's dozens of copper anomalies we know there's uranium so they went and picked up this massive belt um and gave it to us and then the nice thing is so you, you on the almost far west end of it you you, you anchor it with Moran lake which has a lot of growth to go on the far east end you've got michelin and our mustang lake where you know there's uranium so now our goal is to figure out what's happening in between and, and what else is there I want to move on now and discuss your exploration program. What's your budget and exactly how are you going to allocate that budget in the coming year? Sure. So look, we've got, there's two pieces to our exploration program. Um, the fundamental one is, is you know, when you're going to start adding pounds into your resource category, at one point or another, you've got to start drilling and it's the ground, the geophysics and the groundwork. Um, so there's that focus. And then the second area is, is, is we've got a very uh, specific, what we're calling machine learning AI program that we're developing. So to start at the beginning, as of our last financials, you know, plus a, a, a $10 million flow through financing we did, we've got say 16 and a half, $17 million in the bank. Um, with the $10 million of flow through, we have to spend that by the end of 2023. That will not be a problem for us. With the amount of land that we have, uh, and the number of targets that we have, you know, I don't know if we mentioned this, but like in the first pass of this area, when Altius started looking at this land package, they identified 156 targets. Um, so our job is to figure out what those are. You can't drill 140, sorry, 146 targets. You can't drill 146 targets. So we've got to figure out what to do with those. Um, but the plan is fairly straightforward. For 2022, we'll probably spend between five and $6 million on this first program. Uh, the biggest piece of this is going to be at Morin Lake because that's where we have the most information. Um, but it'll be an iterative program. So what we find this year through drilling at Morin Lake, there'll be some more geophysics at Morin Lake and at Mustang Lake to sort of get a clear view on it. We want to get into those core shacks that the government has to look at what's there. 
and then we build on it, plus this machine learning program, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and that, because that itself is going to lead to a larger program in 2023. We have a lot of land, so it will take funding, but for a company our size, we are very well funded. You know, again, it's over $16 million. Um, we want to be smart how we spend it. Just because you have the money, don't don't go spend it and waste it. Um, geology is both an art and a science, so you know there, there's a process to this. Um, but we think we we think we've got a cr pretty clear view. Stephen, as we wrap up, you mentioned that you have 146 targets. You and your team are going to be very busy, but maybe you can just summarize what investors can expect in terms of news flow from Labrador Uranium in the coming months. Excellent. Okay. So. Actually, there's going to be quite a bit of news flow. We've been quiet because we just incorporated and we're trying to put our packages together. So over the next several months, what are we going to see? We've got a, a revised 43101 report coming out. Um, that will be on Morin Lake, which exists actually because um, Consolidated Uranium put one out just before we closed. But it will also incorporate the entire CMB. So we're looking at that historical data and people will then be able to dig in to see what the real information is instead of my just doing the arm waving. Um, also, there was a group that was working with ourselves and Altius that started that first pass of the data. They generated those first targets using a version of, of machine learning, and there will be a report coming out from them as well. So I think that that would be very interesting, especially for anybody who understands geology and uranium to sort of start digging into. Um, we're also trying to get out, and I don't know how long this will take because, you know, I can't, I, AI is not what I do, but we do have the guys that do it but would love to get something out on the first pass of our priority targets that what we're calling like, where are the three to six projects that we have in this area where we'll be really starting to dig down and exploration and spending over the next few years. Um, in the nearer term, uh, we'll be focusing on the permitting to allow ourselves to drill. We'll be building a, a base camp. So permits, base camp and drilling, we'll be starting our drilling campaign July of this year. So that's information that will start coming out from now until the end of the year, because right, you'll you announce the start of the drilling, but then you'll get the data and hopefully the assays. Um, assays are a bit of a problem in the area. They take some time. There's been a lot of excitement in the area. So uh, getting someone to do the proper assays can take time. Um, and then always, we're always looking for more land. Look, we've got an unbelievable land package. Adding land might be like shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit, but, um, we're working this from from a, from a scientific perspective. So as we see potential outside of what we have, maybe we bring in new new projects. But right now, within this Labrador basin, because you know we could spend tens of millions of dollars here, right? So that you don't want you want don't want to dilute yourself too much. But in the end, look, we need to put money in the ground and we need to make discoveries. Our targets are significant, as is our land package. So our goal is make multiple discoveries potentially not just uranium. We know that this is clearly a, a, an area with potential for IOCG and other styles of mineralization, um, but now it, it's putting the money in the ground and, and, and using the best people and technology we can have and make real discoveries. Well, that's a great overview, and I want to thank you for spending time with us today and sharing the Labrador uranium story. And if any of our viewers have any further questions for Stephen and his team, by all means, send us an email to info at bloorstreetcapital.com, and we'll get you an answer to your questions. Once again, Stephen, thank you. Hey, thank you for your time. I appreciate you taking the time and, 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 and the viewers' time. Uh, it's an exciting time in the uranium market. We're positioned to make some exciting discoveries, so watch this space, but, uh, but thank you. Thank you. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Just a friendly reminder to subscribe to our channel, Bloor Street Capital. Hit that notification button so you'll be kept up to date on future events. We have some amazing conferences coming up here in the next few months. Once again, thank you for your support. Enjoy the conference. Hi, Pierre. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Boston? 
Uh, hi, Jamie. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's actually great here. It's quite a lot of thunderstorms this morning, but now the sun's coming out, so it's uh, it's a beautiful sea. I'm quite new to it here, but I'm really warming up to my new hometown. So it's uh, I'm a I'm a very new, happy Boston resident. Boston's a great town. WMC Energy is not a producer and it's not exploring for uranium, but it is involved in the trading of uranium for its various clients. And before we get into the actual mechanics of trading uranium, why don't we just start with a brief overview of WMC Energy and its various services? Uh, sure, absolutely. We're, uh, we're a small uh, Dutch commodity merchant, uh, started in 2016 with only three employees that founded the company. And we grew in 2019 with adding uh, myself and another former colleague at Chemico uh, with me. And, uh, and then it's been basically snowballing from there. And we're currently at uh, 17 employees. And the majority of those are in Amsterdam in our new head office there. And then we got a couple of people in Germany and in Sweden. And then it's three of us over here in the United States. And four of us are working on the nuclear fuel, which was the original business. And it's going very well. And we're very comfortable with that. And then uh, some of them are working with uh, financing because a big portion of what we do involves uh, financing of, of uh, future supply. And then we have a large new group that's rapidly expanding. And that's where most of the excitement is in the company is in battery materials. So uh, we're looking to basically to replicate what we've been doing uh, with nuclear fuel in battery metals uh, such as uh, cobalt, lithium, and uh, um, yeah, we got some manganese and obviously nickel as well. And what exactly do you do at WMC? Um, I, as part of the nuclear fuel team, I am uh, covering some of our clients, uh, trading clients. And uh, because of my history with Chemical, when I was covering the European, uh, Middle East and African market, I also have some of my clients uh, still over there. So the utilities and suppliers over in, uh, over in Europe. But the absolute majority of my time, uh, they changed very rapidly in August last year when uh, we started working with uh, with Sprott and their fiscal uranium trust, uh, which now eventually is, is a full time job for me and has certainly let, paved the way for the expansion in uh, in the, of the uranium and nuclear fuel team here at uh, WMC Energy. So I'm glad you brought up Sprott because I want to use this as an example, but you're on the front lines and you're talking to suppliers, you're talking to utilities, and I want to get a better sense of your day-to-day -day operations as a uranium trader. Can you just take us through this? How active are you? Are, are people, are, are miners or producers phoning you up on a regular basis saying, hey, I got 500,000 pounds for sale, I got a million pounds for sale? Are you taking numerous calls from utilities looking for supply? Just take us through your day. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And it certainly changed. I would say uh, maybe in August, September, it was more about the former, what you said, when people are calling us up and wanting, wanting us to buy uranium. Now it's sort of starting to shift to us chasing them and, and actually finding uranium because we are we are noting that it's getting a little harder to find. So there certainly has a lot of things that have been happening, uh, good and bad, uh, from uh, since August last year. With obviously Sprott taking out a lot of the spot supply, but on the negative side of things, from a, from a humanitarian perspective, of course, the developments in Ukraine. Uh, but that certainly has had an impact on on the security of supply uh, situation in the uranium market as well. But personally, for my day, I uh, maybe start uh, trying to catch uh, some of our friends and colleagues over in Kazakhstan uh, before their day is over, even though they do have a lot of late nights. But uh, but anyway, catch in, uh, check in with them, and then roll over to Europe a little later in the morning to catch them before they go home just to see what's going on over there. And then uh, and then once the market's open here, we obviously have a call with uh, uh, with our friends at Sprott to make sure that uh, so we're ready for the day and know what's going to happen there and keep an eye on the equity markets and try to figure out if it's going to be a busy day there or not. And uh, and then it's starting to uh, yeah start with emails and meetings in general. And that's been a lot more and more of talking to investors and, and educating investors on the, the nuclear field in general, but even the, also the uranium market, of course, and uh, and people are quite interested in learning more about it. So it's a uh, it's a very exciting time to be in this field. And I, I want to get a sense of the difference between dealing with a financial player like Sprott versus a utility like Constellation Energy, and maybe you can just take us through that and, and just how their perspectives are totally different. 
Uh, oh, absolutely. Of course, very, very different uh, different players. Whereas this fraud is a fund that raises raises the money, and then we buy near term uranium for delivery as, uh, within a few months, uh, and have no plans to do anything with that uranium. It stays where it is. Whereas we're, when you're a big utility such as Constellation or EDF or Vattenfall, uh, what they do, they obviously they buy uranium to burn in the reactors, and that process uh, it, you don't look for delivery within a few months. You can have deliveries starting a few years out in time. And, and even if you are getting delivery of uranium in the coming months under a longer term contract, that uranium is probably not going to be used for another few years anyway, because it needs to go through the, the a few steps of the fuel cycle chain to, to, to be transformed into a nuclear fuel element. So it's a much of a longer process. And there's very few utilities that are actually active in the spot market. Most of them are doing bilateral longer term contracts with established suppliers of uranium, such as Cameco or Gasatomprom or Nirvana or BHP, uh, the, more, the more primary supply players. But uh, what we did see uh, over the, with the bear market time, if you will, in uranium, when you had a huge surplus of, of spot material, then uh, what there was room for financing entities or intermediaries such as ourselves, where we would essentially source very affordable uranium in the spot, we find it financing entity with financing it for us because then they would have a receivable, receivable uh, towards a, a large utility, established utility out in time. And that was a very successful trade for us. But as we've noticed, the, uh, the contangle in the market disappears, uh, that those opportunities are not there. So I want to take our discussion, I want to dive a little bit deeper into pricing and, and the various components of the nuclear fuel cycle. And it starts with mining, which is the buying and selling of uranium, and that's followed by conversion, then enrichment, then fuel fabrication, and that goes to the nuclear reactor, and finally we get electricity. So why don't we just start with the spot market? That's where you spend a lot of your time. The price has been hovering, hovering around $50 a pound in spite of all the positive factors. So maybe you can just give us a sense of what's happening in the spot market. Why aren't we seeing a, a higher price given all the positive catalysts on the horizon. Mm. Yeah, I think it's kind of a little bit of what I referred to before, uh, that the utilities aren't necessarily active in the spot market and the demand that was created in the spot market for onward sales to utilities is not there anymore because the spot market has been pushed up and now we're, we're more in a flat market. It was a backwardation for a bit, even though that might have disappeared, but at least it's a flat market. So that finance and carry trade is not there anymore. So most utilities are active on a market further out in time. So then the, the largest spot buyer has, without a doubt, been uh, spot or the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. It's over 50% of the of the demand since uh, since September last year, which is obviously a, a very large player. We wish we were there with more, it was more buyers in there, but uh, it just, uh, a lot of people have been hesitant. Obviously, there are very, very big changes going on in the uranium market right now. People are just trying to wrap their heads around potential sanctions and, uh, and overall demand. Uh, so definitely a lot of a lot of uncertainty. But uh, but still, I would say I'm a little bit surprised. I'm not seeing more buyers in the spot market because you look at the fundamental story. It's never been better. It's it's just pointing in one direction. There is definitely room for higher prices. There will need to be higher prices. Um, but I think it's just a matter of timing, maybe, that the uncertainty scares away people. And that's why I, I, I don't see any positive aspects whatsoever with, uh, with the Russian invasion in Ukraine. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a horrible from a humanitarian aspect, but even, even the market itself, we had a very good story even without it. So the added uncertainty and, and demand, if you will, uh, and stress on the system that this is causing with potential sanctions on Russian material, it, it's not only good, it's almost creating too much stress on the system and it's causing some players to hold back where, whereas it was not necessarily the case before. In, in a typical year, how many pounds would trade in the spot market? Uh, I would say, uh, typically, it has, it's changed a lot. Say uh, during the last run up uh, in 2007, it was maybe 25 million pounds and uh, last year it was uh, about 100. So the spot market has gone a lot bigger and the primary driver for that is uh, the investment community. And, and by saying that it's not just uh, the, 
the funds such as FUT and Yellowcake. There are also junior miners have, have been buying a bit of uranium as well uh, early last year. I think it added up to about 50 million pounds. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty significant portion that the investment community is, is buying. So 100 million pounds traded in 2021. We're halfway through 2022. How many pounds have traded thus far? Ah, that's a good question. I think we're not on track just yet to have a year as uh, in 2021, but I would expect it to be uh, probably around 30 million pounds, something like that, maybe more. So that's a good overview of the spot market. Why don't we move on now to conversion and enrichment? And before we get into the pricing of those elements why don't you first tell us what conversion is and what is enrichment absolutely and and, and it, as i will explain it actually ties together very well because they are they are interconnected uh they, there are connections between these different components and they may affect each other's prices so u308 yellow cake that uh, that everybody's familiar with is by far the most liquid traded product so uh, Sprott has made the decision to only focus on U308 because that's where you have a daily price. It's, it's the most liquidity, easiest to find product. Uh, the U, the conversion uh, services, or we call it UF6, because you basically convert the uranium oxide into a gas, uh, uranium hexafluoride, uh, and you do that in order to enable the process that's called enrichment. That's the next step. So, so the it, it's a, it's a, the conversion is a very simple chemical process or as simple as it gets. Uh, there's no there's no nuclear energy or nuclear, uh, and so you're not changing the atoms in any way, you're changing the molecules obviously, but it's a pure physical or chemical process, uh, but it's a very necessary step. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's a straightforward process. You have it in Canada, you have it done in, uh, in Converdine and here in the US and also in France uh, with the RANA's facility and clearly there's some capacity in Russia and China as well. But, but yeah, that's the, uh, the straightforward process is you change it from a powder into a gas form. And once you have it in the gas, uh, it's converted to UF6, then you send it in cylinders, it's not drums anymore, uh, to the enrichers. And that's, uh, that's obviously a, a much more but the process itself maybe not complicated, but it's it's, it's quite difficult to uh, to what you're trying to do because you have the uh, the two isotopes on uranium you're focusing on is uh, uranium 238, which is uh, the majority of it. It's about 99.3 percent, and then uranium 235, which is the fissile isotope, and that's the one you focus on. And in natural uranium, it's about 0.7 percent. But in order to run that in a, in a commercial light water reactor, like we have at least in the US and most of the Western world, I know Canada has a different approach, but we'll pass on that for now. Uh, it's, uh, you need to enrich that to between three and 5%. And, uh, and it basically means that you need to change the concentration of the 235 isotope to from 0.7% to three to 5%. And uh, the, the way it's done today is you basically put it in a centrifuge and it spin it really fast. And the concept is that whatever is heavier goes on the outside and whatever is lighter goes on the inside. And obviously there's only a 1% weight difference. So it's, uh, so it's by no means an easy process. You just basically repeat it a million times and put a cascade of these, uh, of these centrifuges together and you just keep repeating it until you, uh, you, you do enough work until you have the enriched product that you can finally, uh, the, the, the concentration of 235 is high enough that you can put it into a reactor, a fuel rod and then into the reactor. Um, and uh, there, there's lim limited capacity of this around the world, uh, but over the last few years, especially with uh, the shutdown of a bunch of reactors in Japan after Fukushima, there's been a clear overcapacity of this. So, because these cylinders, they just keep spinning, you can't shut them down. They're basically suspended on the electromagnetic uh, um, sort of apparatus. So it's uh, so there's no friction, and then you basically spin it several hundred rotations per minute. Um, and once they're obviously it's up and running and spinning, you don't want to stop it because then you get metal on metal again, and you just don't want to have that happening. So you just keep running it. So what's been happening over the last 10 years when you've had an oversupply of, of enrichment is that uh, because you don't have need for the enrichment service itself and you keep spinning these, uh, these centrifuges, you do something that's called underfeeding. So if you're the enricher, the person with this uh, facility, 
you get uranium delivered to you, the UF6 we talked about before, the converted product, you get that delivered to you from your end customer who's buying the, uh, the enrichment from you. And then uh, you have that delivered to your facility, you feed into your, uh, into your centrifuges, and then once you're done, you get the enriched product. And if you keep repeating this with the same amount of uranium you put in, there's no necessarily a, a, a natural stop to how much in 235 you can extract under this. Normally you stop at, you're going from, uh, from 0.7, and then on the waste stream or the depleted uranium, we call it, and maybe you run that down to 0.25 or, or 0.2. Uh, but it, it depends on, on the economics. How much do you pay for SMU? How, how cheap is the uranium? And if you have the overcapacity of, of enrichment, you just let it run. And you can run it down to, I think it was 0.15 maybe even. So what that happens then is that you get the amount of enriched material you need at the end, but you're left with a bunch of uranium. You basically have it running as a uranium mine. So all this leftover uranium stays with the enrichers and they can then in turn sell it into the market. And the portion of that over the last 10 years have been about 20 million pounds a year. So that's a, that's a cigar lake, it's a MacArthur River. It's a, it's a combined, it's an enormous mine. And, uh, and as things are very rapidly changing uh, with Russia having about 40% of the world's capacity of enrichment services, you can imagine that if that all falls away, uh, now there is enough enrichment capacity in the West to cover the Western needs, but what's then going to be happening is that the underfeeding is obviously going to completely go away. Uh, that's already been committed, whatever enrichment is left. But if you're going to have further enrichment needs, you can certainly create that enrichment by just starting to feed even more uranium in. But what then happens is that rather than ending up with a bunch of spare uranium, the enrichers themselves, they need to go out and source that uranium. So now you've gone, you've gone from being a source of uranium to a sink on the system. And the swing, it was just discussed in a conference in Montreal over the last couple of days. And the number that was presented from, a, from an industry uh, expert is uh, up to 50 million pounds a year, the swing. So you go from supplying 20 to uh, being basically a demand for 30, uh, more up to 30 million pounds. So it, it's an enormous swing, uh, and and that's clearly going to need to be priced in as we go forward. So why don't we let's just take a step back and, and look at conversion, and why don't you just tell us what the price of that has done in the past six months or in the past year, just so yeah. we have a better understanding of what's happening in that market. Absolutely, uh, it was about in the mid-teens uh, about a year ago. Um, so it's been I was hovering around. Uh, 15, 16, maybe up to 20. And what happened was that Converdine, uh, just like Cameco did with their mines, Converdine shut down their facility and, and purchased uh, conversion in the market instead because the market was so soft, it simply did not support running the operations. It was down towards four, four, five, six, seven dollars. Uh, and that it ran, once that happened, it ran it up to slightly above 20, but then it started drifting down again. And, and Orana with their facility in France, they were ramping up. So it felt like, yeah, price is gonna stabilize in the mid-teens and even come down a little bit. And uh, yeah, uh, on Tuesday, we had a bid at $31. So you're looking at, and this is very rapidly, and, it, and it's purely a function of, uh, of the situation in Ukraine, that uh, fear of sanctions, thinking there might be a shortage of enrichment, which in turn means that enrichers are gonna have to buy uh, uranium and conversion. And conversion is a key. Uranium you can always find. That, I mean, it's just a matter of paying the right price for it. But considering con Converdine is shut down, France is slowly ramping up, Cameco is, is already running Fort Hope at full capacity, or close to anyway, uh, then uh, there might be a limit into how much uh, conversion you can find. There are inventories, absolutely, that can be, that can be out. But Clearly, the price is thirty dollars a, a kilogram now. They have a different unit on that, but it's it's still it's doubled in in less than a year. And is that thirty dollars a kilogram? Is that an all time high? Uh, it's the highest I've seen, and I've been in the market for for twenty years, but I haven't heard of anything being close to that. So I, to my knowledge, is it's an all time high. Yes. And you already touched on uh, enrichment and pricing there, but once again, just. Give us an overview of what's happened there in the past year. Yeah, that's, uh, I think it was uh, in about a year ago, maybe in the 40s. And the whole 
decarbonization, electrification, transportation, that whole uh, net zero uh, story, which is a very, very good story for nuclear energy, it started creating demand, not only in uranium, which was uh, sprung, of course, but even on, on conversion and certainly enrichment itself, people start realizing that, yeah, there's going to be a need for this. Um, so that started creeping up from, uh, from mid 40s, uh, slowly up to a uh, low 50s. And then Russia happened. And then uh, right now, if you're going to buy enrichment a couple of years from now, you're looking at $150 uh, a swoop, which is the unit there. So spot prices might be a little lower, but that's very, we were trying to buy it and we just can't find it. So there's a little opaqueness. There is not really a liquid traded market. Even if you were going out and try to find spot enrichment today, it's impossible almost. And, uh, and say it's going to take four or five years at least uh, to build and expand uh, enrichment capacity and build new facilities. So once that is down, then maybe I think the long-term price is around $130 a swoop. So that's, that's what people are looking at further out. But there is a squeeze in the middle where we're seeing prices up to $150 a swoop. So if I'm understanding you correctly, right now the utilities, the end buyers of all these products, they're more focused on conversion and enrichment and less focused on the actual raw material at this time. That's why we got significantly higher prices in conversion and also enrichment. And I guess you could say languishing prices in uranium. That's absolutely correct. And it's also the natural order in which you procure this stuff because uh, you first uh, buy the fuel fabrication, which is a technically very complicated. There's not that much uh, money in it compared to what you pay for enrichment in uranium, for example, but it's the most time consuming and it's, uh, and it's very exact and it's very technically complicated. So that takes some time and you do that first and then you work your way backwards in finding out how much enrichment do I, then do I need, how much conversion do I need, and in the end, how much uranium do I need? So it's also the natural flow of things. So if you, if you were to guess, I know you're not clairvoyant, but when are we going to see a lift in uranium prices? I would say, oh, I mean, I think it's already, it's already, already coming back uh, in the 50s. And uh, I don't know if it's going to take the summer or not, but by the end of the year, I'd be very surprised if it, the number doesn't start with a six or a seven or something higher too. But that's pure speculation. But just seeing the need that is waiting out there, and um, by no means saying that they have to be there, but just knowing that as a utility, you, what's happening with the electricity price, sure, uranium might have doubled in 12 months, but the electricity prices are far more than doubled. And your fuel costs as a utility is maybe 10, 15% of your operating expense. So you can absorb a lot more than a doubling in uranium price with a doubling or a tripling of electricity price. So I am not concerned that there will be um, demand destruction based on uh, uranium prices. And at least the, 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 the general sentiment from the being on the conference for the last few days is that there won't be a shortage of material either. It'll just be a very significantly different price. So I want to move the discussion now toward a timeline. And if you're the lead on a fuel team for a nuclear reactor, what kind of timeline are you looking at for acquiring all these components of the fuel cycle? Yeah, see, uh, the uranium, normally you buy it, you look a few years out in time because you have already a pipeline of contracts delivering there. So very few of them are exposed to, to uranium needs uh, within the next year, certainly. So you're probably looking a little further out, uh, I'd say a lot of 24, 25, 26, 27. And, uh, and that's, that was also made very clear from suppliers that even if you're as a utility, you might, this is exactly what I want. Uh, and, uh, and I want this much flexibility so I can decide how much I want to take and I can, and, uh, and there's my wish list and I expect to get everything. While that has been the case over the last 10 years, uh, it's very rapidly changing into a seller's market where the sellers have made very clear that just because you might want to buy uranium or commercial enrichment in these exact years, we may you want to want to commit to longer term prices. Because I heard uh, the head of the commercial teams from Cameco and Converdine and Urenco, all three saying that uh, 
we are not putting money into any kind of expansions or mine restarts until we have the long-term contracting to support that. And I felt like it was pretty directly uh, addressed to utilities. And how much inventory would a typical utility have on hand? Let's just once again use Constellation as an example, given that they have the largest fleet in the U.S. How much inventory would they carry? I'm not familiar with Constellation, because but I used to work for a Swedish and a Swiss utility, so I know what the European situation is. And there you might sit on a on a reload at the time, at least at the at the site, sort of fabricated and ready, and then you have. The other components you could have it just as enriched uranium product, and you can have it as UF6 and UK08. So, uh, so you have a sort of pipeline constantly moving. But, uh, but as a, as a, at least a regular US or European utility, normally at least one reload on site and another year or so worth uh, in the pipeline at any given time. So that's also what I, what I like to when when it's in it with the energy security is such a kind of topical issue right now and uh, especially if you have a gas power station you sit in, in Germany or Finland or wherever you are and and Putin decides to shut off the gas well you got to shut down your, your power your power station the same hour more or less because you have no fuel for it and you don't really store that much on site now if you have a nuclear power station uh, first of all you only refuel it once every 12 or 18 months so even if there's an immediate call to deliveries you won't notice it right away and in a lot of cases, you do have a bunch of fuel elements on site ready to be loaded as well. So some of these utilities, they'd be fine. Even if everything was shut off today, three years, they'd be just fine. I'm not saying it's the case for everybody, but I am saying that the nuclear, a nuclear power station is very, very different in terms of security of supply for fuel than a fossil fuel power station. So... I want to bring all of these elements together now and get your sense of, of what's happening and, and how utilities are thinking. You were just at the World Nuclear Fuel Market Conference in Montreal, speaking with maybe a few investors, but mostly utilities. And, and what's your sense when it comes to the spot market? Do they really care if there's financial players involved soaking up all this excess supply, given that they don't really focus on the spot market? Are they more concerned about the, the term market and what's happening with Russia? I would say uh, in the beginning of, uh, of Sprott's entry to the market last fall, when we also didn't have the Russian situation, uh, it, it was clearly a hesitation and more looking at yeah, what, what is this thing that has come into our market and it's clearly rattling cages and turning everything upside down and everybody wanted to talk to us and ask what we're doing and we noticed you know some were not only positive uh i would say that has changed partially because they have you know, bigger fish to fry right now there are bigger more important things going on but it's also a lot of utilities and i think there's a, not only to be nice to us uh, when we meet with them one-on-one -on -one, but it also they do see that it's uh, it was clearly not sustainable prices before. When you're at $25, $30, nothing is being put into uh, inspiration. I, I seriously doubt that Cameco would have made a decision to restart uh, Cigar Lake uh, if, or MacArthur, uh, if, uh, if the prices wouldn't have been in the 50 spot, prices wouldn't have been in the $50 range. Now, not necessarily, and they'd be the first one to say, we don't necessarily look at the spot market, but in turn, that has also affected the term markets because there is the connection between the prices, of course. So, uh, so it, it clearly has helped, and utilities recognize that the increase in spot price for uranium has enabled some juniors and larger miners to to stay in business to make more long-term decisions. So it's not going to be that crazy spike we saw in in 2007 and it come crashing right back down. It's going to be more of a gradual based in approach. And I think everybody thinks that's a good thing. Uh, so it's so from that perspective, it actually has a bit more of a balancing effect in the market. So it's not as negative when it comes to it was the financial entry into the, to the spot market bad thing. And we're also trying, saying that every every chance we get is that it's not just dollars coming into and buying uranium. There are also dollars coming into uh, uranium miners, so they can expand their production capacity and they can have the juniors can make more exploration, they can start to think more longer term. 
uh, we have investors who ask us, yeah, this is a great story. We're, uh, we're loaded up on, on Sprott, we're loaded up on Cameco. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna get into utilities, who should I go to? And then it was like, well, there's one very good play in the US right now, and that's Constellation, because it's a pure play on, on Nutrier. And I think their share price, at least last time I checked a month or so ago, was, there was up about 50% since, uh, since the inception of, or the split of that company. So it definitely has a good effect on the market in general with the entrance of it. I think it's good for everybody. Um, as the utility, when you look at the security of supply and what's had the development in Russia, that's clearly a, a cause for concern. Uh, there was uh, a utility from my home country in Montreal of Sweden. And I think that and fall, if people didn't know about it before, a lot of people have heard that name and they're asking, what is this thing? And it, it's a basically a, a state-owned uh, large Swedish utility. And they went out the day after uh, Russia went into Ukraine and they said, we're, uh, we're suspending all deliveries of Russian material. Uh, and I don't know if they canceled the contracts yet, but it's certainly, uh, certainly in, probably gonna happen. Uh, so they went out the next day and clearly they need to replace uh, their material and they have been busy and they are busy. They were there and they're talking to everybody and they are very proactive in this. And uh, I would have surprised maybe not more utilities followed suit on that, but it also of course it depends on your exposure to uh, to Russian deliveries and, and, and other situations. Uh, another company that was there was Fortum. Uh, it's a, a Finnish operator who has a Russian design rack, two units, uh, Russian design, not far from the Russian border. And they have what's called the rifle plant supply of fuel. So the Russian would supply uh, all the fuel elements to that facility for the, the, the complete lifetime of the power station. They just filed for, uh, for a 20 year life extension. And, uh, and they were obviously gonna be relying on, on Russian fuel, but now Finland's applying to go to NATO. There's, all sorts of situations going on in Europe. They, they're clearly not going to be reliant on Russian fuel anymore. So they are they are signing contracts as we speak to to replace that. So there is a lot of things going on, and and a lot of utilities are clearly planning for it. I I would say almost every utility, even if they're not openly are doing it, uh, you they are active in one way and planning for it in one way or another. Yeah, and I think that's what makes this market so fascinating is also the geopolitical aspects of it. So I have to ask you about this announcement that came out of the DOE or the Biden administration. It hasn't really been confirmed. We haven't seen a lot of details, but they want to spend $4.3 billion on domestic enriched uranium, I believe was the headline. Can you just put that into perspective? The announcement came in the middle of the conference and uh, in the morning and I like I was in a bunch of meetings. I was listening to uh, the speeches and presentations, and I didn't hear anything about it until uh, until it hit the Bloomberg screen and the market exploded more or less. So it's a, uh, I think, uh, I mean, of course, it's a, it's a positive news for the industry, but I don't think anyone in the industry itself thinks that the uranium, or I think that the U.S. government is going to come in and soak up all the uranium enrichment to conversion they can find. First of all, it's not going to help, uh, and second of all, I, even the the numbers that they have there, uh, it doesn't translate to astronomical amounts of uranium anyway. It's uh, it's basically two million pounds a year maybe, and then you have the equivalent amount of conversion and enrichment to that. But uh, but yeah, there's a lot of ifs and buts around this. Nothing has been decided. But the positive thing I think is that it's it's a sign from the U.S. government that they are taking this seriously, and it could of course also be that. A signal that yeah, something is coming down the pike, and uh, we're not completely ignoring you. Pierre, as we wrap up, you've been involved in many aspects of the uranium business for over many years. Have you ever seen a time like this one that we're in right now, where the path forward points to a significantly higher uranium price? I have not. Uh, I mean, I started in the last run up and we said it was like a nuclear renaissance and it was it was a lot of hype around it. And I, I, I did not train uh, in the nuclear field. That's not where I started, uh, but I was drawn to it because they thought there's a really good, uh, there's a good case here uh, from uh, climate mitigation and uh, even from the uh, an economic perspective and clearly now decarbonization, electrification of the transport sector, all of it, it's been a very good case for a long time and it continues to be an even better case. 
Um, but of course, the air went out of the last one because the price run up was a little too fast and yeah, Fukushima happened, a financial crisis. This time around, it feels like it's a lot more supported. Uh, so it's, you're getting, uh, you're getting long-term goals uh, and targets from governments. It's actually being enacted into poli active policies as well. And I would say that the industry itself is also much more mature to be able to handle this. So it's a, it's, it's an extremely good bullish investment case, in my view. Uh, the Russian situation, Ukrainian situation, it's definitely fuel on the fire. It might not be that uh, that long lived, or we don't really. Should. There's a lot of uncertainty around it. But even without that, the, just the the decarbonization and the electrification of the transport sector, that case alone, uh, we're obviously very much looking at a WNC because of our activities in the battery materials. And uh, I mean, every single light is green. It's uh, it's it's all systems go, and it's just uh, it. Yeah, I think also it's the right thing to do, but it's also a very good investment case. So it's a very, very exciting time to be in this field. Well, Pierre, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today and telling us about WMC Energy and also telling us about the various components of the nuclear fuel cycle. Once again, thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. It's always a pleasure. Hi, John. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Casper? Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, beautiful day in Casper. The birds are outside chirping. A nice, uh, cool spring day. Great time to be in Wyoming. John, as you just mentioned, your energy is based in Wyoming, and Wyoming is one of the top uranium destinations in the U.S., and it has been mining involved in the mining of uranium since the 1950s. But many investors might not be familiar with Wyoming as a mining state. Can you just, just provide us with some background? How important is mining to the state? Oh, you know, Wyoming is a resource recovery state. Uh, we're the top coal producer in the U.S. and have been for quite some time. A lot of oil and gas production, trona, uranium. Uh, it's a real natural resources state, and the regulators understand that and appreciate it. Uh, we've got a great set of regulations in place, uh, very well experienced regulators uh, to inspect and to have oversight. And even our, our politicians, uh, they have a, a lot of involvement in the mining industry. They understand what it is we do. It's a very sparsely populated area. And you know, even our senators, our congressmen, we know them. It's not unusual to go to a football game on a Friday night and to run into one of your senators. And you know, probably three quarters of the people in the audience know them. So that's not unusual in Wyoming whatsoever. So it's a great place to be a uh, great set of regulations, a great climate for us to, to be in, uh, in uranium or coal or whatever commodity that you're recovering. So great neighborhood. And I'm glad you brought up the politicians because once again, when it comes to mining, this is very important to have the politicians on your side. Senator Barrasso of Wyoming has been a strong proponent of uranium. Why don't you just touch on that and, and just tell us how helpful he has been to the industry? You know, he's led the charge for our industry for a long time, uh, and so have others. Uh, you know, Senator Enzi, when he was with us, uh, uh, Congresswoman Cheney, uh, Lamas, uh, all of those have been uh, great advocates for the industry. But Senator Barrasso has really led the charge for us. Uh, when we filed uh, the Section 232 petition, he was very supportive of us in that regard uh, and called for changes in the way that we do business in the nuclear industry globally. Uh, even now, he's advancing legislation uh, dealing with imports of material from Russia. So he gets it. He knows the story. He knows how important the nuclear industry is uh, to Wyoming and to the nation. So he, he leads the charge, and he's always happy to talk with us. He's happy to talk to anybody in the nuclear fuel cycle, and he's on the right committees to, to be able to help us out. Yeah, we need more politicians like that to push nuclear power forward for sure. John, you have two producing mines, both of which are in Wyoming. Lost Creek is your flagship property and was a past producer. Can you provide an overview of this asset, please? Oh, yeah. You know, it, it is one of our flagship properties. It's been a great producer. Uh, it's been in production since August of 2013. 
uh, great head grades coming out of the ground, uh, just a prolific producer. Uh, since we've uh, ramped it up, we've produced 2.7 million pounds of uranium and have delivered most of that into contracts. We still have some inventory uh, on hand uh, from that site. Uh, but great head grades, great resource in the ground, 11.9 million pounds of measured and indicated, an additional 6.6 .6 million pounds of inferred. And, you know, every time we go out and we explore at Lost Creek and that area immediately surrounding it, we keep finding more resource. And we believe we can continue to do that uh, going forward. So it's got all the major permits, all the minor permits. It's up and running. We've got staff out there. They're producing pounds today. So it truly is our flagship property, and we're really proud of it. It's been a really low-cost producer, and we look forward to wrapping it back up going forward. And let's just talk about the timeline associated with that. At, at full production, how many pounds annually will it produce? And what's the timeline in meeting that full production? You know, since the plant is already built out, the pipelines are built out, and we have a lot of well field constructed, the header house 2-4 in particular, uh, we've been drilling in it, uh, the wells are installed, and we're working on the header house right now. Uh, we're very confident that we can get ramped up to about a million pound a year run rate in a time period of about six to eight months. And as we continue to, to drill and to construct, we are hopeful that we can shorten that time frame uh, to be able to sell into contracts very quickly. So that six to eight month time period, that's not to start, that's to get up to that million pound a year run rate. And we've been successful in ramping up the project in the past. In the past, we've got a lot of the, uh, the staff that have been there for a long time still there and we're confident that they can bring it back online in good order. You mentioned the resource is 11.9 million pounds. What about your all-in cost? You know, that's one of the things that we're uh, really well known for in the industry is the low cost of production at Lost Creek. Uh, if you take a look at the mine site all-in cost uh, historically, but also what we're modeling going forward, it's just you know, a little bit over $16 a pound once we get ramped up, uh, which is an incredibly low cost. If you throw in the all-in uh, site cost, uh, not just the operating cost, but the all-in, we're just over $33 a pound. Uh, again, fantastic cost structure, and uh, we believe we can get that again, especially when we ramp up to that 800,000 pounds to a million pound a year run rate. We enjoy those economies of scale, and with that, we bring down the cost. So uh, we really feel very strongly that we can get back to that price level again, in fact, uh, earlier this year, as part of our annual report, we came out with a technical report uh, where we reviewed the cost going into the mine site, and uh, the numbers came out very similar to what they have historically. And so we're confident we can get back to that price level again. Your second operation is Shirley Basin. That's also located in Wyoming. Can you provide an overview of this asset? Yeah, you know, it's not quite as big a project as Lost Creek. But nonetheless, it's a very quality project because the grades are very good and the ore is very shallow. Uh, it's 8.8 .8 million pounds. All of the resources in the measured and indicated categories, we have nothing inferred. It's completely drilled out. So we have all of the historic data for it. And uh, when it comes time to ramp it up, we can jump out there and begin installing production wells on day one uh, because everything is well defined and we've got that data. Uh, so it is a brownfield project, and uh, there's a lot of historic data with it. Along with that comes a lot of infrastructure that's already in place, and that will help us keep the cost down as well. The roads are there, uh, the power lines, the, the substation, waste disposal cell, and we even have two really nice shop buildings that we can work out of. So when it does come time to ramp up, what we'll need to do is we'll build out the back end of the plant, essentially just the ion exchange column portion, and the well field. And what we intend to do is once we load the uh, resin with uranium, we'll put it on trucks and take it a relatively short distance over to Lost Creek for processing there. And that way we, we don't have to build out an entire plant at, at Shirley Basin because we'll rely on Lost Creek to, to do that for us. And I'm sorry, what's the distance between the two assets? Yeah, it's about 100 miles. Uh, two-lane highway most of the way, and a little bit of gravel of the last few miles. So pretty easy access for a resin truck. So you mentioned the resource at Shirley Basin is 8.8 .8 million pounds. What's your all-in cost? For there, it's going to be a little bit less than at Lost Creek because the deposit is shallower. 
and because so much of the infrastructure is already in place. So we're looking at a little bit under $16 uh, site cost, uh, operating cost. And again, looking right at about $33 a pound for the all-in cost of production at Shirley Basin. So another very low cost producer for us. So once again, you mentioned at Lost Creek, that's already up and running. It's producing uranium now. What about Shirley Basin? What's the timeline associated with this for it to go into production? Yeah, so it'll take a little longer to get it up and running because it's not been constructed out yet. So we're looking at a time period of about 15 to 18 months to be able to build out the plant, ramp it up, and get it up to a full production rate of a million pounds a year. And I should comment, you know, between the two properties, Lost Creek, the well field or the mine portion, is licensed at 1.2 million pounds per year, and Shirley Basin is licensed at 1 million pounds a year. So between the two, we can produce up to 2.2 million pounds a year from the mine sites themselves. The mill at Lost Creek, it's licensed at 2.2 million pounds. So we'll be able to process a full production load from both Lost Creek and from Shirley Basin uh, at Lost Creek. And given your, that you're ramping up at Lost Creek and also building out Shirley Basin, are you having any issues, supply chain issues, getting critical equipment or materials such as reagents? Yeah, you know, that's such a big issue these days uh, with supply chains, and we're well aware of that. Uh, some time ago, we implemented a program where our engineering staff, they went out with their list of equipment, supplies, chemicals that we need and they uh, talk to the vendors, the suppliers, and say, okay, how much does it cost? How long does it take to get it here? And in what quantities can we get it? And we've developed a spreadsheet where if it starts to take too long to get material, uh, that's gonna interfere with uh, our ability to ramp up, then we go ahead and order that in advance. So we already have the materials we need for the next couple of header houses. And even beyond that, going into the third header house as we ramp up, there are some really long lead items out there that uh, we're aware of, especially with regard to monitoring equipment and electrical supplies like MCCs and transformers. And because the lead times have gotten so long on those, we've already gone ahead and ordered for outlying header houses, so those are on the ground. But one of the advantages we have at Lost Creek as an operating mine, if we run short on equipment, we can't get it in, we can go to historic production areas and simply move that over from old areas that have been turned off and move it into new areas so that we're not beholden or, or slowed down by any supply disruptions. So right now we've essentially got 13 header houses that we could go in and take certain parts from and advance them and move them forward if we needed to. So while it's a, certainly a concern of ours, we believe we've got it well managed and under control going forward. And John, I was going to ask you what uranium price you need to go into production. And I guess given that Lost Creek is in production, I guess the current uranium price is sufficient. Are you going to sell that into the, the spot market? Or are you going to hold it back and just build an inventory of uranium? Yeah, so Lost Creek is in production. It's producing pounds today, but it's at a very slow rate. So it's not a, a consequential amount that we're looking to put into the spot market or even uh, uh, anything beyond that. We are looking to sign long-term contracts with the U.S. utilities, and we're in frequent communication with them. In fact, next week, we've got meetings scheduled in Montreal uh, with most of the U.S. utilities to talk to them about contracting. There's, there is certainly a growing interest in the U.S. to be able to acquire Western pounds or domestic pounds uh, so they can reduce their reliance on Russia and Kazakhstan. So we look forward to being able to get those contracts in place. Uh, but we get asked a lot, you know, what price do you need to incentivize a full ramp up? And it's not something that we really answer directly uh, because we don't want to tip our hand to our competition, what we're going to be bidding uh, when RFPs come out. Uh, but we are a very low cost producer. And, uh, you know, I've given you the numbers on that. And so I think people can look at that and also look at our historic contracts and say, hey, look, back in 2012, 2013, your energy was signing contracts on the order of $50 a pound. If you multiply that by inflation, you're gonna get pretty close to what we're expecting uh, to contract at today. We're a really low cost producer globally, uh, probably the one of the cheapest outside of Kazakhstan. 
And because of that, we can go into production and justify that much sooner than a lot of other companies do. And in fact, I heard uh, one of our competitors, their CEO said a few days ago during an interview that he expects that uh, a lot of companies will need $75 a pound to be able to justify a ramp up. And I don't think he was talking necessarily about his projects. I think he was talking globally, but I think he's right. I think there are a lot of projects out there that are gonna need around $75 a pound, uh, given inflation, given that scarcity of materials, uh, to be able to justify a ramp up. But that's not us. We're a much lower cost producer. We can get a much higher percentage return at a much lower uh, price than a lot of companies can. So we don't need 75. I'd be glad to take 75, but uh, we certainly don't need 75 to be well into the money uh, to start up production. Great comments. I want to move on now and examine your balance sheet. How much cash do you have on hand and, and will you need to raise cash in this coming year, given that you're ramping up two operations? Yeah, so we've got a great cash position right now. Uh, the last quarterly report uh, the, uh, that we gave uh, came out the end of April. At that point, we had uh, $45.8 million in cash, which is a great position. Uh, in addition to that, we've got inventory that we are ready to sell when the time is right. That's 284,000 pounds. And uh, that's worth about $14 million today that we can bring in uh, from the sale of that on the spot market. We have held on to that because we're hoping to sell it into the uh, government program. Uh, but nonetheless, it's available to us to sell into the spot or to the government and bring in some cash. So if you combine the cash position uh, in addition to the value of the inventory, that's taking us upwards of $60 million uh, that we've got available to us to help us with ramp up. So to do a full ramp up, before we do that, we would really like to get contracts in place, long-term contracts. And at that point, when those contracts are in place, we'll focus first on Lost Creek, ramping it up. And then if we're able to completely fill the book up, uh, we'll go over to Shirley Basin and begin to ramp it up over there. But to bring Lost Creek into production, we need to uh, put about $14 million into the well field. And to bring Shirley Basin into production, since we have to build out an entire uh, back into the plant there, we're looking at about 30 million uh, to do that. But we believe at that point, if we've got those contracts in place to justify the ramp up, that we've got some mechanisms out there to raise money if we need to. Uh, we believe right now we've got nearly enough cash to be able to do it. But if not, uh, we can go out and uh, either raise money through equity, or in the past, we've been able to get uh, loans through the state of Wyoming at incredibly low interest rates. And we believe there are similar programs out there today that if you've got a contract in hand, that uh, you'll have access to some of those loan programs, especially in some of the, uh, the very sparsely populated areas we work in. There are a lot of programs out there to incentivize the build out of, of uh, industrial facilities. So we think we've got a lot of opportunity uh, to go out and raise money if we need to, but sitting here today, we don't need to. Uh, you know, we do have an ATM facility that we used uh, quite a bit back in 2021. Uh, if people have read our 2022 uh, Q1 report, they'll see we've used it a little bit, very little. And uh, we may continue to use it a little bit going forward. Uh, we don't expect to lean on it very heavily uh, because we've got plenty of cash in hand. So uh, we've, we're in a good place. We're really happy with where we are as far as cash and the ability to ramp up. So you brought up the fact that you do have uranium in inventory, the Department of Energy issued a request for a proposal or an RFP for its plans to create a commercial quantities of uranium for the U.S. Uranium Reserve. Given you have this uranium in inventory, will you participate in this RFP? Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Uh, last month, Secretary Granholm with the Department of Energy came out and said, hey, in June, we plan to come out with an RFP uh, to begin buying pounds to fill the uranium reserve. And that uranium reserve has got $75 million allocated to it over a one-year program. So with those inventories, we think we are very uniquely positioned to be able to sell into that reserve. And we look forward to being able to do that. And as soon as we get that RFP, we'll be sharpening our pencils and see what we can do uh, to provide uh, sales to the U.S. government and help fill that reserve. Since it's a one-year program, we don't foresee that anybody in the U.S. will be ramping up production uh, to sell into that reserve. 
So we think the, the first round uh, we really will be limited to those companies that have inventories. And again, we're uniquely positioned there uh, to be able to sell into that because we have uh, inventories, 284,000 pounds, 100% of which was produced in the U.S. and the vast majority was produced at Lost Creek. So yeah, we're excited about that. That's been a long time coming. And as soon as that comes out, uh, we're going to jump on it. And John, is there a dollar? You said it's only good for one year, but is there a dollar value uh, placed on this or, or how many pounds are they looking for? You know, we won't know that until they come out with the RFP. It's possible they will have just an open bid process. It's also possible they'll come out and say, uh, we'll buy pounds for X number of dollars per pound and we want X or Y number of pounds. So we'll have to wait and see what they come out with uh, with the RFP, but that'll be a public process, I'm sure. And the U.S. is the largest consumer of uranium in the world. It has the largest nuclear power fleet. How many pounds of uranium do they need annually to fuel those reactors? Uh, you know, in the last two years, about 45 to 50 million pounds per year is what we're consuming in the U.S. Uh, globally, that number is pushing 180 million uh, pounds per year, but it's projected to grow uh, rather rapidly over the coming years because there are so many countries right now that are building out uh, their nuclear fleets. John, as we wrap up, what news flow can investors expect from your energy in the coming months? So a couple of things we're really working on right now. Number one, most importantly, is contracting. And uh, you know, with the market going the direction it's going and with geopolitics being, geopolitics being what they are, we are feeling uh, pretty strong that we're going to see some contracting before the end of this year. Uh, we think the spot market is beginning to dry up. Uh, we think that there's potentially some significant overfeeding that could happen, uh, which will increase the demand for material. So I think that puts us as miners in a great position uh, and we should expect contracting going forward. So that's number one on news flow. Uh, number two, uh, some of our research and development uh, that'll be coming forward. We've been talking about that. We're excited about that. Uh, the first one would be the new well installation technique. Uh, we believe we have found a way to uh, drill wells and install casing much cheaper than has been done in the past. And that could have a material impact on our bottom line. And we're, we expect to be going out and testing that literally within days now, uh, because we do have the approval from the regulators and we have the patent in place. So we have the green lights there that we need to go out and do the testing. Uh, the second one though is water treatment and filtration. And uh, that's gonna take longer, but we are working on the engineering on that. And we expect to have news later in the year on that. So it's gonna be an exciting year between contracting, uh, some of those research and development projects, hopeful, hopefully those will bear fruit. And hopefully uh, once we get contracts in place, they'll be sufficient to justify a ramp up. So. Uh, we're hoping that uh, the last half of 2022 is a very exciting year for us at Your Energy. Well, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today and sharing the Your Energy story. And to all of our viewers, if you have any further questions for John and his team, by all means, send us an email to info at floorstreetcapital.com and we'll make sure you get an answer to your questions. Once again, John, thank you. All right, thank you. It's good to talk with you. Corey, thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Saskatoon? Hey, James, thanks for uh, the invitation uh, to be part of this event and for hosting it. Uh, things are well in Saskatoon, much like my second home in Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan. Uh, we're finally starting to see some, some warm weather after a very long, cold, snowy winter. So same kind of conditions on both sides of the planet and uh, it's going well, thanks. Corey, we usually speak with Askar, who is always a great source of information. He's the chief commercial officer for Kazataprom. He's based in Kazakhstan. But many people don't realize Kazataprom also has representatives in North America, one of which is you. So why don't we just start right there? What is your role with Kazataprom? 
Sure, it's uh, it's been great to work alongside Askar and his, his marketing and sales team. Uh, he apologizes, by the way, in this particular instance, he had a prior commitment. Uh, as for me, I've been working in the uranium space for just about 20 years now, uh, picking up a wealth of industry experience with the major global uranium producers, and I've taken on a variety of roles. I'm actually a professional geologist by training, and I started my career right out of school doing uranium exploration, geology, and field work in Canada, a little bit in Australia. And I wanted to see uh, uranium beyond the chemical element and experience it as, as a commodity. So uh, with that target in mind, I managed to, to wedge myself into a corporate strategic planning role for a few years. And uh, that provided, I think, a strong foundation for a move into corporate disclosure and investor relations. And I shifted a little bit further, even so from my technical background to land a position as manager of enterprise risk in a, a billion dollar global mining insurance program. And uh, that, I think, provided, again, a good foundation uh, just before this opportunity at Kazadamprom came up. So following Kazadamprom's IPO, I took the role of Director of Investor Relations in January 2019. And my mandate was to help establish a new IR function uh, to kind of a Western standard that better connected CAPS management with the investment community. Um, IR, not a very a common local discipline in Kazakhstan, let alone IR combined with uranium backgrounds. So when I joined CAPS IR team, uh, consisting of Boda, Ayman, and Malika, who are, who are on my team, I added that uranium and nuclear industry element with an international perspective. And uh, we set out to work standardizing the whole new set of internal disclosure controls and processes and procedures, uh, working across the company and its subsidiaries to ensure consistent messaging and ensuring that all stakeholder audiences were hearing the same thing. So I lived in Nur Sultan, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, worked at the corporate office for the first year I was there, a year and a half, uh, while my wife and kids were in Saskatoon. But when COVID hit, I was faced with the prospect of, of working alone in my flat in Kazakhstan. So um, now, thankfully, the, the company allowed me to work a couple of years remotely. I'm now considered the international advisor on investor relations. Uh, Boda is, is the director. And uh, I go back every couple of months now that we can travel again. Here in Canada, I, I work the Kazakh morning office hours, which are always 12 hours ahead of Saskatoon. So I start my work day at 9 p.m. every night uh, online till about 2 a.m. And I'm back at around uh, 9 a.m. local time to then spend a few hours on the North American morning. So we're, we're really a, a full service IR shop here at Kazadam Pro. Those are tough hours. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it took some getting used to, but like I said, it, it has been a, a pretty good time in the industry to be able to provide uh, information at all hours, so to speak. And you also have a U.S. office with a U.S. representative who speaks with U.S. clients and utilities. Maybe you can just touch on that and also tell us what sort of feedback or what is the, he hearing from utilities in the U.S.? Sure, yeah. Our, our rep office uh, is located just outside Washington, D.C. in Bethesda, Maryland. And it provides uh, a non-commercial auxiliary function to support the company's long-term relationships with our customers in North America. Um, we also maintain a pretty confident footprint in the, the U.S. nuclear community through uh, principal membership in many industry platforms, including Nuclear Energy Institute, WNFM, WNFC. And so I think maybe that office is a little less known to the investment community, but our customers and our clients know it well. They've been engaging with the CAP Rep office since 2013. Uh, we've developed strong relationships across North American continent. Uh, there we have Alex Mashenko. He is leading things down there. He brings a, a wealth of industry experience uh, coming from Siemens and Nukem. Uh, he's actually on his second tour with CAP, uh, having been with the company a decade ago at a very obviously different time in our history. Uh, so he's very well connected across the industry. He actively participates in all the major industry conferences and events, and uh, he's regularly meeting with utilities and clients. Uh, the rep office maintains contact with existing customers, with new stakeholders, uh, including the utilities, the, the analytical agencies, the regulatory bodies, associations. And we're proud of the quality of the relationships we've built now with the North American nuclear community. And we appreciate you know, that, that full confidence, particularly in these trying times. So having Alex and I on the ground here in North America has proven to be extremely valuable, as I said, in terms of communication, particularly back in January when the head office was limited on its communication and uh, during those tragic days of unrest, it was difficult. So having us here was, was excellent. Um, in terms of what the utilities are saying, uh, they're obviously watching the situation very closely and we have regular meetings with them, their, their procurement, their legal, their, their risk mitigating specialists. 
and we address regular questions with them and we are able to provide them with thorough views of the policies that we have in place uh, to ensure the interrupt, uninterrupted supply. And our customers have come to expect top tier performance and that's what we'll continue to deliver. So the feedback's positive, um, despite these unprecedented and challenging times, and we've shown our ability to, to not only remain flexible and responsive, but uh, we're actually able to substantially grow our North American portfolio recently. And this is without question a tribute to our, our American partners' deep understanding of the level of expertise at CAP and a vote of confidence in our fundamentals. Corey, I want to move on now and discuss the term market. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has impacted many markets, especially the uranium market. Now that the war has been going on for a few months, how has it impacted the term market more recently and how has it changed since the beginning of the invasion in February? Sure. I, I think the best way to describe what we're seeing, not only in term market, but just generally in the, the natural uranium market is somewhat of a tactical pause uh, with our clients now you know, carefully monitoring the overall situation. Their motives, their decisions are not only dictated by the supply chain disruptions and, and Russia being essentially excluded as a future source of enrichment services, but the utilities are finding themselves in kind of a perfect storm. Uh, the present global conflict and its effects aside, many utilities are only now finding their footing with more robust budgets, uh, cautiously favorable government policies, and and positive momentum for the industry. So it's completely understandable uh, that the utilities are carefully considering and reconsidering their future needs and you know, looking at this entry into the current contracting cycle and maybe planning around risk mitigation is a critical aspect of their decision making. And now as they continue to form their procurement policies amid the Russian conflict in Ukraine having to be something they consider, um, most of the current activity, especially going into summer, is looking to be focused on conversion and enrichment markets with the need to then lock up the required natural uranium to feed those services being something that is expected to follow. Corey, I want to move on now and discuss Russia and its relationship with Kazakhstan. Kazatoprom has five joint ventures with Russia's Rosatom. Currently, Rosatom has been excluded from any sanctions and as a result, there's been no disruption in operations. However, recently there were media reports about a meeting between Kazakhstan and Rosatom, with Rosatom expressing a desire for further development in Kazakhstan's uranium sector. Can you just speak to this? Absolutely. You you saw us push out a news release actually last week, um, and that was just after that media story came out about that meeting. And that's because there was a few stories coming out at once. And I think if viewed from a, a mosaic perspective people could be putting together some incorrect conclusions. So as is the case with many of our partners, uh, meetings often take place that involve some combination of, of Kazakh government officials, Samra Kazina representatives, and of course, Kazatom Prom is the national operator for the nuclear industry. And that meeting was no different. Uh, it was reported to involve government officials and Rosatom. However, Mr. Sharipov, our, our CEO, was also present. Unfortunately, the media highlight that emerged focused on Rosatom's comments about expanding cooperation in nuclear and, and mining in particular. However, because Adam Prom reiterated our focus on mitigation and minimizing our exposure to the risks that we are now having to manage in the current environment. So while each side you know, stated their piece, it's important to remember, I think that nothing was decided by that meeting. And, and as per our, because Adam Prom's regulatory rules as a listed company, something does change or come up. We're always going to be transparent and, and act according to our governance in the best interests of our shareholders, majority and minority, and, and we're going to follow our disclosure practices. But, I mean, bigger picture, it's also a difficult ESG story to manage through. There's, that's undeniable. But it's a story that many companies in many industries across the globe are having to manage through right now, and it isn't easy for anyone. For the nuclear sector specifically, uh, the Russian fuel cycle, it's integrated into the global industry as anyone, and uh, intricate economic ties, contracts, partnerships, it's all requiring now very careful management attention, and hence our news release to, to clarify that. And once again, this goes back to what you said earlier about applying a North American investor relations approach to Kazataprom. You're also listed on the London Stock Exchange and you have to follow disclosure rules. And this is just one of the things that you and your team are trying to communicate with. Yeah, absolutely. And if I think first, maybe going back to your original question, first and foremost, I think it's it's important to separate Russia and Kazakhstan, whether you're talking politically or in, in terms of the, the uranium industry. Uh, 
we have to reinforce all the time that, that Kazakhstan has been and continues to be a responsible member of the global nuclear community. We've been maintaining a policy of strict compliance with any sanctions implemented by the EU or United States. And as you can appreciate, the situation continues to develop almost daily and we remain vigilant in factoring in and responding to any changes brought forward uh, by the political realities and the industry policies. We have a solid management team. They understand the industry. Uh, we've established a strong governance framework. The key decisions uh, have the input uh, of our independent board members. They're based in the UK, US, Australia all with a wealth of, of nuclear and financial sector expertise. So uh, the long shared history between the two countries has naturally resulted in economic ties. And we as Kazatomprom, the, again, the national operator for uranium mining and the entire nuclear fuel cycle in the country, we find ourselves in a situation, I think, where we have to frequently reinforce the distinction that Kazatomprom's natural uranium is at no time considered Russian supply. Um, regarding the potential sanctions um, in the Russian nuclear sector, absolutely top of mind. It's something that we are constantly monitoring and dealing with and having those five joint ventures with the Russian partner, that creates significant risk. Uh, so in the event that we're faced with challenges in operating those JVs, we're preparing all available options to minimize the impact on our business. Um, that said, uh, going to the, the supply chains themselves, uh, the ability to run our mines at the moment, not significantly impacted because uh, Russian companies operating the nuclear space especially are not sanctioned and it would it would absolutely be a stretch to say it's business as usual that's not the case with all these overhanging risks but the the direct impact on operations right now is minimal um, the op the impacts we're experiencing right now in terms of limited supply of certain materials and costs I mean that's that's still related to the lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic so I want to move on now and talk about transportation and also logistics. I was going to bring up supply chain issues, but you've already addressed that. But the pandemic has caused supply chain and logistical issues everywhere throughout the world. The Russian invasion has only compounded this problem. The transportation of uranium out of Central Asia has been a concern. Currently, all uranium delivered to the West goes, goes through St. Petersburg. As of yet, there's been no sanctions on uranium, but of course, this is still a risk, as you've already mentioned. Are you and your team still working on developing the alternative route through the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea? Yes. Uh, transportation of, of class seven nuclear material, as you'd be aware, is always, always more difficult, even in normal times. And despite the multiple ways of sanctions that we've now seen uh, coming out of Russia, growing limitations on Russia's exports across the board, we have not yet seen transshipping options for class seven material through Russia coming to a complete halt. In, in fact, we recently completed the physical delivery yellow cake under a contract with them. But I mean, open or not, we have noted for a couple of months now with, with you and, and pretty much every conversation we have with investors that the key risk beyond the potential secondary sanctions um, that we could face uh, in relation to the transportation side, that is that is a primary risk. Our mined material moving through Russia to the port of St. Petersburg. So we fully appreciate the host of limitations now that this option could be facing from European ports self-imposing uh, sanctions to uh, possible challenges with ensuring class seven consignments through Russia to the cost pressures. But that has been our primary route for years and we're still able to use it, as I said, as recently as mid-May. Um, we're just working with shippers and insurers on exemptions uh, under the energy products uh, on a very specific shipment by shipment and even route by route basis. And we are continually evaluating that risk in the context of, of our risk tolerance and because Adam Prom's deep knowledge and experience in the jurisdiction. And if it becomes too much to bear, we do, as you said, have established and permitted the alternative route in place for exporting uh, to because Adam Prom's material to the Western converters. And of course, we're actively uh, working as we've heard recently to help partners get their share of production moving as well. Uh, on top of all that, we are currently working alongside the Kazakh government in their discussions with other nations in the region to develop additional alternative options and routes because as you'd suspect, I mean, this issue goes way beyond just class seven cargo, but the priority for us obviously is meeting our, our commitments to customers, using the tools we have available, but there, there is no denying the increased risk facing 45% of the world's primary uranium production, it's, it's an evolving situation. And Corey, just to clarify, if tomorrow you can't ship through St. Petersburg, are you able to start shipping through this alternative route like as soon as possible? 
Yeah, we could do so in the near term for for because out of promise production, we could move it through those routes. And as I said, we're working um, on in getting the partners' involvement in those routes as well. It is permitted. We have uh, used it. I think Asgard said a few times now since 2018, when it was established uh, around the World Cup and limitations in St. Petersburg at the time. So we developed that route in order to maintain uh, the ability to export the permits in place. We have been using it annually uh, and keeping that up. So we could do that. Um, and that, that uh, helps us ensure that we are meeting our customers' uh, requirements and commitments in the, the near to midterm. And so you wouldn't expect any time delays? No, uh, we, as I said, we, we've used our existing route recently and, and in the event that that was uh, cut off, uh, we would be able to, to shift over to some degree to the alternative route. And are, would there be any constraints or restrictions associated with this alternate route? Well, at the moment, that is something that uh, Askar and team are, are working with uh, the, the regional governments around us and the, the, uh, the countries that we are passing through on that alternative route uh, to ensure we have the necessary capacities. Corey, one of the things that I really admire about Kazataprom is regardless of what's going on in the world, and we've seen a lot of tumultuous events here in the last few months, but the company just continues on. And you and your team have continued meeting with clients, meeting with utilities, you're meeting with investors. Recently, you were in California at a Canaccord mining conference. During the same week, you were also in Miami at a Bank of America conference meeting with investors. What sort of comments, what sort of questions are you hearing from these investors that you've met with in the last couple of weeks? Yeah, it was it was a very hectic May. Um, finally, being able to be on the road again, we we crisscrossed the U.S. with our, our chief commercial officer Askar and our chief financial officer Camilla, uh, talking to investors. They sat on a couple of uranium panels to have discussions with investors, and both conferences were great. Lots of interest. Uh, I want to say we met with about 25 members of the institutional investment community, and they were there from a wide variety of global geographies. Uh, in terms of conversations we had, I think as always, you've, you've been right on point with your questions here today. Same topics were covered uh, with those conferences and meetings. And maybe I'll mention the only outlier, perhaps. Obviously, we had a few existing shareholders that uh, wanted our view on Kazana Prom's share price weakness, which has lagged behind our peers and our competitors all year so far. Uh, while we don't comment on, on share price specifically, there's no doubt geopolitical risk is the focus. And it started with uh, the risk off movement of capital from the European and, and Central Asian jurisdictions to something that was deemed safer. Uh, but even now, months later, we're still yet to catch up. And it's a tough situation because in, in a $50 spot price market, you have Kazatomprom, the world's largest, lowest cost producer, still looking to be quite discounted. And uh, being the, the first IPO out of the country's privatization program, that meant we had to overcome some uncertainty about the geopolitics and maybe just a general lack of knowledge on Kazakhstan. Uh, we diligently push past that regular disclosure, consistent transparency, strong governance, but there was always thought to be that discount remaining in relation to the higher perceived risk. And it's persisted for the past three years, but now it's almost like there's a doubling down of that discount related to the same risks that we thought were built in. So from our side now, it's really just a matter of, of as you said, keeping up with consistent disclosure and transparency, uh, remaining present at the key investor events, uh, conferences, reiterating our focus on building that long-term value and trying to be patient as investors digest what's happening in the broader markets. And Corey, as we wrap up, what can investors expect in terms of news flow from Kazataprom in the coming months? Well, we're moving into what's usually the quieter summer months now shortly, but, but in June, we do have another conference here in Prague, a boutique from Wood & Company, and the World Nuclear Fuel Markets Conference here in Canada. And our next corporate update will be coming with our trading update beginning of August, and that will come out just ahead of our uh, mid-August half-year financial results in a conference call. And uh, maybe I'll just mention too, uh, it's been a couple of years now, but we're finally, I think, considering maybe a late fall investor day and potentially a mine tour in Kazakhstan, but nothing nailed down yet. So I guess maybe I'm being a little early on that comment, but do stay tuned for more comments on that in the, the coming months, uh, if we can make it happen. Corey, sign me up for that site visit in Kazakhstan. I would love to go. I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today and providing an update on what's happening within Kazataprom. Absolutely, anytime, James. And as you know, as your audience knows, 
Well, we are uh, fully engaged with investors, both uh, institutional and we welcome comments from retail. Uh, you can hit up our IR inbox at any time. Great. Once again, thank you. Thanks. Hi, Grant. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Saskatoon? Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, summer's finally arriving on the prairies. So wonderful time of year. Grant, May and June have been very conference heavy and you and your team have been on the road meeting with investors all across the North America. What are the common themes or questions that have come up during your discussions with institutional investors? Great question. Uh, a couple of themes. Number one, and this is really good news, the debate seems to be over. When, when we were saying that the risks to supply were far greater than the risks to demand, you know, we were still having to argue that with some folks and, and nobody seems to, to want to argue that anymore. So, so that's a major theme, walking through what are, what are those risks to supply as, as, we, as we really are on, in unprecedented geopolitical times which gives rise to the next uh, theme, which is geopolitics. You know, we, we, we're spending a lot of time talking about uh, what a bifurcated market looks like and how folks should, should think about the need for supply and where there's going to be a need for supply in a market that bifurcates. And, and that's an important focus for sure. Uh, if there's a third theme, it really is the reminder that unlike natural gas or unlike coal, you, you don't take uranium oxide and throw it into a reactor. Uranium is a really important part of the product, and it is the product, but then you have to add some really important services to it, the service of conversion, the service of enrichment, and then the service of fabrication. And with the attempts to exclude Russia from the Western nuclear fuel supply, the, the typical uranium investor has been really forced to understand what that nuclear fuel cycle actually looks like. And uh, it is different and it's more complicated than just throwing coal in a furnace and producing power. It's a, it, it, is, it is quite a bit to get your head around it. So we've been spending a lot of time on the complexity of the nuclear fuel cycle. And you know, if there's a final theme, it's just this question of, okay, if the risks to supply are greater, if we are in a bifurcating market, if the demand outlook is strong, why aren't prices doing better? And, and so then it's the reminder that, well, again, unlike coal and, and natural gas, there, there really isn't a spot market. Uh, our utility customers are, are dealing with these challenges. They're working their way back upstream from enrichment through conversion. It's led to a bit of a pause in the uranium space, but here's the good news. You know, enrichment jumped by $50 a couple of weeks ago and jumped by another $10 this week. Conversion's never been priced higher than it is today. And uh, that demand that's right now focused in those services uh, needs to ultimately come into the uranium space, which is the product those services are applied to. So that's what we've been talking about for the last number of weeks. That's great, I'm glad you brought up conversion. I wanna speak more about that later, but right now I wanna talk about the term market. So much has changed since we last spoke in March, and I wanna get your thoughts on how the term market has changed. You ref have referred to this period after the Russian invasion as Russian replacement period, and the market's gone from one of long-term in nature, focused on longer-term contracts, bigger volumes, to one more focused on enrichment. Can you just speak to this, please? Yeah, and I'm, by the way, I'm glad you start with the term market, uh, and, and, I, and I think it really is a testament to how well you understand the uranium space. Uh, this isn't a spot-driven model. This isn't a, a world where you know the spot price goes up and then we rush ahead with our demand or our supply, whether it's in uranium or whether it's in the services, to try to meet spot prices. That's not how you capture value 
in the uranium market. And anybody who tries to tell you that uh, clearly doesn't know what they're talking about in this industry. So you really do have to look at the term market. The term market was very focused on uranium in 2021 and in early 2022. Uh, in 2021, it was really the fundamentals were improving and utilities were turning their attention to the long rate run rate requirements for their reactors on the uranium side. And then of course, the, uh, the, the geopolitical situation in Kazakhstan in early January uh, really consolidated that focus on the uranium space and led to quite a bit of success for us in the early part of 2022. Uh, and then February 24th happened. And February 24th, actually took the attention away from the uranium segment and moved it downstream. You know, as you know, the Russians are 40% of global enrichment, a quarter of the US market, a quarter of the Western European market. They're 30% of the global supply of conversion. That's about the same size we are. And so utilities who thought they were really well covered on those very important services are, are suddenly realizing, uh, you know, they, they, they need a different strategy here. And so we're seeing um, if not, we haven't seen formal sanctions yet on, on Russian nuclear fuel, but we certainly have seen self-sanctioning going on. Vast majority of Western utilities believe it's a question of when, not a question of if they've got to get off Russian supply. So that contracting focus shifted downstream to enrichment and conversion. So it's giving rise to the prices I referenced earlier, a 60% jump in the long-term price of our $60 jump in the long-term price of, of SWU in the last several weeks and uh, conversion prices that have never been higher. And that's come at the expense of that, that, that laser focus that was on uranium earlier in the year. But the good news is that demand doesn't disappear. It's just been delayed. And now likely the uranium demand will show up in a far more concentrated way, which is always great for price discovery. Given Russia supplies 14% of uranium production and is responsible for 27% of conversion, 39% of enrichment services, can this new green world or a world focused on decarbonization proceed in a world without Russia? Yeah, you, you bet it can. Um, there, there, is, there are resources on the uranium side that are on what you might call the Western side of the map. Uh, there are uh, resources in the uh, conversion space. Uh, con conversion began its supply discipline before uranium did, actually several years before uranium did. And, and conversion can increase in capacity and, and there can be reinvestments in Western enrichment, uh, including our project, Global Laser Enrichment, which we're pretty excited about. That's not for tomorrow, but, but that is for a Western market that is really trying to, on a long run basis, secure Western capacity. So it is possible, there's no doubt about it, it will take time and it will take money because in most cases, the Western cost curve for those services and for the uranium is just higher than it is when you include Russia and Central Asia, for example. And so prices will have to respond. They will have to respond to, to levels that are encouraging uh, those with the productive capacity to go ahead and invest in it and know that they're investing in it for, for returns over a substantial period of time. So, so it absolutely can respond. In the, in the near term, this is a moment of destocking. This is why utilities uh, carry inventory uh, precisely for situations as this. So we'll see some destocking, probably see some strategic inventories be available. Then we'll see the productive capacity increases, and then the Western world can, can meet its needs um, by excluding Russia. And you've mentioned this many times before, but you've talked about the scarcity of supply and the concentration of supply. How has the term market changed here in the past six months? And do you think these changes will be permanent? On the uranium side, uh, the term market changed in some very significant ways through 2021 and into early 2022. And we just see these trends continuing. Number one, uh, the carry trade has disappeared. And, and that's just a function of the spot market becoming tighter and tighter. So utilities don't have the ability to go into the spot market buy significant volumes or have somebody buy it on their behalf and carry it on an interest rate curve 
uh, out into the early part of their term demand. That that business has kind of, kind of gone away. Spot market's tight. Interest rates are going up. Doesn't make sense for carry trade. So what we've seen is the tenor of term contracts extend. Instead of a two to four year bite out of the market, we've seen two to seven years, two to 10 years. We've seen volumes go up, not just because more years have been added, but, but also because um, they're just taking bigger bites and looking for a claim to that future productive capacity. And the timeframes have increased. As, as fuel buyers become more uh, confident in the life of their assets, uh, they're more confident in stretching out their procurement terms in terms of time frame. And, and so we're seeing that increase as well. And, uh, you know, even with a bit of a pause on the uranium side, while well, enrichment and conversion are the focus, uh, we, we don't expect those trends to reverse. So I want to spend a little more time on conversion. And many people think of Cameco as a miner only, but as you already mentioned, you're also involved in refining and conversion and fuel fabrication. And Cameco's conversion facility uh, located in Port Hope, Ontario, it's the only operating conversion facility in North America. What capacity are you licensed for at that facility? Yeah, that, that facility has a license capacity of 12,500 tons of uranium uh, converted into uranium gas, which is the state it needs to be in to enrich. We, we've been producing as low as 6,000 tons a year as we were engaged in very significant supply discipline on the conversion side, similar to what we were doing on the uranium side. Uh, and now we've been ramping it up, but it's the same. It's the same focus for us as it is on the uranium side, which is the utilities actually have the most important tool in the toolbox here. And that's the tool of their procurement. You know, our desire to get to higher levels of production is a function of how much they want to contract. Again, we see a tight spot market for conversion, but that doesn't encourage us to sell into the spot market. That encourages us to see that spot market stay tight long enough for us to lock that value into multi-year contracts that become the basis for our production decisions in Port Hope. So we can, we can go up a bit more, but that will be a function of the, uh, of, of the building of that contract book, our ability to layer in more conversion service sales, and as well, our ability to take the demand for conversion and drive it upstream into demand for uranium by saying, you know, we're happy to sell UF6, uh, we're probably, you know, we'll sell you the uranium and the conversion together as you have six. And, uh, and so we're, we're just in that process, taking advantage of, of, this, uh, of this market and these prices we see to capture as much value for as long as we can. In what capacity are you currently operating at? Yeah, you know, the, the Port of Conversion facility is going to run about 10,000 tons this year as a function of the 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 book that we have to deliver into and then with spot prices as high as they are they are there's opportunities uh, m maybe there a little bit but but really it's the longer term focus for us it's translating a tight market into longer term value capture um I'm, over time we could get up to the licensed amount our, our plan would then be to run it at that licensed amount for maximum economics for as long as as long as we can recognizing the conversion market can respond to these higher prices. We have a facility, we don't have a facility. The industry has a facility in the US that was shut down as part of supply discipline. And, and it could come back, produce 7,000 tons of, of uh, conversion, maybe even 10,000 tons of conversion. There's a facility in France that's operating at about half uh, of its intended production, but, but it also has some flex up on top of that. So we have to be very disciplined. Uh, the goal here is not to bring on a bunch of conversion production that drives down the conversion price into the future. The goal is to, to recognize it's an important service. It's an important service that's needed by the utilities. Um, and, and we've got a, a, a very key facility and uh, we have the ability to underpin terrific margins in that facility. And Grant, you touched on this earlier, but if you don't mind just repeating, uh, what have conversion prices done year to date? Well, um, 
you know, and maybe a little bit more of a historical perspective, when we began the supply discipline in the conversion uh, space, you would have seen spot conversion below $5 a kgu, and you would have seen term conversion $6, and these are US dollars, $6.50 a kgu. And I just happened to be looking at the price post the other day, the, the, the North American spot price for conversions over $30 a kgu, and the North American long-term price for conversions 24.50 a kgu so we've seen a very substantial uh price response in the conversion business uh th that we think you know just it represents uh what we've been saying is characteristic of the uranium segment as well and that is the risks to supply are greater than the risks to demand in the conversion we've now seen it and therefore it's it's translated into pretty strong price discovery and you mentioned earlier that the U.S. facility, uh, which is owned by Honeywell, they're in the process of starting up again. Is there a timeline associated with that? Well, I, I can only go on, on what I've seen them put out, which is an intention to be up and running by the end of 2023. So I imagine that imagine that, that involves some commissioning in 2023, as, as whether that's ramped up to 7,000 tons or whether that's 7,000 tons on an annualized basis. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the target is, but, uh, but certainly it is a critical facility in, in, in the U.S. strategy to, to exclude Russia uh, from the nuclear fuel cycle. And, you know, we, we've seen those folks in the industry for a long time. They're good operators. They, they'll, they'll get their plant up and running and, and they'll, they'll be providing conversion services uh, in, into our market. I want to move on from conversion now and, and talk about your Q1 uh, press release that came out here last month. And one of the things that was mentioned in there, you mentioned that there was a reemergence of RFPs versus off-market transactions. And to an outside observer of the uranium market, what exactly does this mean and what can I read from this? Yeah, so a, a bit of... Uh... A bit of a, an update on that disclosure. We were seeing a, a pickup in on-market RFPs, but then as the attention became really focused on the enrichment and the conversion space, we then actually saw those on-market RFPs for uranium step back a little bit in the time since we put out that news. But why it's important to focus on is generally in our industry, um, our fuel buyers, are they swim upstream. You know, they, they start with their services, fabrication, then they go to enrichment, then they go to conversion, uh, and then they turn their attention to uranium because now they know where those services are delivered and they know where to send the uranium. So, so they generally swim upstream. Um, and, and generally when contracting begins, it, it often begins as what we call an off-market exercise. So the utilities that have more confidence in their fleet uh, looking at their run rate requirements often come to those they already have contracts with and, and start to layer in new volumes, extend current contracts, perhaps new pricing mechanisms. But that's really kind of the quiet off-market phase. And then you start to see more testing of the market in the on-market RFPs. So, so then the next phase is you start to see more visible demand come into the market. And then ours is an industry where demand begets demand. You know, utilities, certainly they watch the supply side and they watch our announcements, but they also watch each other. And, you know, and it, it, catches, it catches a collective attention when someone comes out with an RFP. And, and so that we, we've just view, viewed that as a, as a leading indicator uh, over the years. And, and that's why we want to help, you know, help people see the world through our eyes by pointing out when we're starting to see those signposts as we're driving down the road. Grant, I want to move on now and, and discuss your balance sheet and also capital allocation. As of March the 31st, you had $1.5 billion in cash and a $1 billion credit, $1 billion credit facility. How will you allocate this cash in the coming year? Yeah. The, our focus in the last number of years has been discipline. It's been marketing discipline. It's been production discipline. Uh, but it's also been financial discipline. And, and we're, it's important to, to always remind uh, everyone that, uh, yeah, we've got a very strong balance sheet. This was on, on purpose. This was deliberate. 
This was to make sure that uh, we were investing, and I use that word deliberately, we were investing in a strategy of marketing and supply discipline that we were pretty sure was going to pay off. Uh, we, we, we shut down MacArthur River when, when uranium was $17 uh, a pound, basically, just close to $18 a pound. And, and, and now, obviously, those pounds we left in the ground are worth a heck of a lot more. But that was a very significant investment. And it was important for us to have the balance sheet so that we could self-manage risk. We, we didn't want to be halfway through that investment and then have to make an awkward lurch to the capital markets and say, well, we, we took on an investment we just simply couldn't see out. So it was important for us to be very, very financially disciplined. We're still in supply discipline. You know, we still haven't layered in all the contracts that we would want to layer in. Deliberately so, because now's not the time to be sold out. We want leverage to a market that we think is improving. We're planning on bringing back MacArthur, but not at full production. Our, our guidance for 2024 is MacArthur will get up to 15 million pounds a year. That's 40% below its license capacity. And at that time, our guidance is to bring Scar Lake back to a lower rate of production. So we're still in supply discipline mode as we're still in a market discipline mode. So our balance sheet is, is, is very strong and it's to back up just the, the final, I would say, hard yards of this uh, discipline strategy. But over time, as that book of business builds up and more certainty and predictability around the earnings and the cash flow, it, it, it'll give us the opportunity then to step back and say, well, obviously, as a principal, we're not our owner's savings account. Our, our owners can manage and invest their money far better than, than we can. So we'll look at the sources and uses. We'll look at our leverage. We'll look at our investment opportunities. Uh, against our book of business. And uh, at that point, we'll make uh, appropriate capital allocation decisions. But, but, but at the moment, we're just, we haven't captured the value that we intend to capture from the turn of this cycle because it still is early innings. So Rio Tinto is in the process of, or has a process for its Rough Rider asset. Is this something you and your team would look at given its location but also your cash position you, you know there is the, the nice thing about the uranium space for us is, is there's not a project out there that we are not completely aware of and entirely familiar with and and for us we we just see the value coming from our brownfield leverage strategy taking macarthur from 0 to 15 and 15 to something and you know, maybe Cigar pulling it back or running it at 18, and there's a phase two at Cigar Lake, and we've got an extraordinarily good asset in Kazakhstan with Kazatom Prom that's running at 20% below subsoil use, but under the right conditions, it could run 20% above. We, we've got all of this licensed, permitted brownfield infrastructure that is by far the best value driver than anything that smacks of greenfield. So while we look around and we're very active, keeping an eye on, on different opportunities, there's nothing out there that, that we would obtain, acquire, that we would bring into our portfolio that would actually outcompete the pounds we already know and already own. And that's just a reality of the resource base that we currently sit on. So um, gosh, you know, <laughs> It's not that we're averse to deals, but deals have to add value, and uh, we see more organic value in our current portfolio. So far more focus on organic growth. Grant, as we wrap up, yeah. we're halfway through the year, and it's been a busy one for you and your team with the signing of 40 million pounds of uranium in early January, February the restart of MacArthur River. What else can investors expect from Cameco as we move into the second half of the year? Well, you know, we we hope and we expect that that that, that folks just, just know we're going to do what we say we're going to do. Right? And that uh, when we say we're going to continue to be disciplined on the marketing side, we're going to capture the value where it makes sense to us. We're not going to chase volumes when it doesn't make sense to us. Doesn't make sense to us yet to run all our assets at full production because while the demand is picking up in the uranium segment, it's not at replacement rates yet, which have always historically been the trigger for really strong price formation. So we'll be patient and we'll wait for that and we'll continue to be financially disciplined so we can self-manage any of the headwinds that are either 
you know, industry specific or more, more, more broadly, the macro headwinds, and, and we will self-manage those. So we're just going to, we're going to continue to do exactly what we said we were going to do. And, and that is capture as much value uh, over a sustainable cash flow and earnings um, perspective uh, as we can for our owners. Well, Grant, I want to thank you very much for making time today. It's always insightful every time we speak. Thank you.